Hello. Good morning, everyone. Hi, hi, hi. Hi. We are so excited to have everyone here this morning. If you're checking in from YouTube, say hello in the comment section. If you're checking in from Facebook, say hello in the comment section. My name is Shah Ravine. And I'm Deshonda Brown. And together we are the Bridging Beauty and Wellness Conference. I just literally cannot tell you guys how excited I am to be here with you all today. Today's my birthday. Happy um, birthday! Which is why I'm like so super dressed up, but we're gonna get right into it. Um, like I just said before, my name is Shah Ravine. I am born and raised in New York City. Today's my birthday. I turned 25, you guys, and I really could not think of a better way to spend my birthday with you all. A little bit about me. I am a writer and digital content creator. I spend my days at GMA and the digital department and my nights doing all things social media, all things Shaw Ravine on the internet. And of course, all things Bridging Beauty and Wellness Conference. And I'll let Shonda introduce herself. What's up, everybody? My name is Deshonda Brown, but I go by Shonda. All my close friends call me Shonda. I am a lot of things. I'm a co-culture curator with Shah Ravine. Her and I came together to bring you this incredible platform, the BBWCon 2020, first of many. I am a journalist for Revolt TV, Blavity, XO Nicole, Hello Beautiful. I'm a freelance publicist, mental health advocate, suicide um, attempt survivor, and I am the wellness portion of the Bridging Beauty and Wellness Conference. And we are so blessed to have 600 of you all here with us today on this Sunday morning, Memorial Day weekend. We know that every single one of you could be doing a billion and five other things, but the fact that you all wanted to spend it with us and the fact that Shaw wanted to spend her birthday bringing this incredible platform to 600 of you, 16 speakers and myself is nothing less than a blessing. So we thank you all so much for, for being here. We have such a great lineup for y'all. Yes. Um, and thank you. I can see the comments. So thank you to everyone who is saying happy birthday to me. I really, truly do appreciate it. <laughs> I'm going to try not to get too distracted because the comments are going crazy. And I love everyone's energy. And I love that you all had decided to spend your Sunday afternoon with us. Um, just a little bit about, you know, how this conference even became a thing and how we even got here today. So um, as we know, we're all facing this pandemic and it's all affecting us in different ways, which is a big reason why we wanted to create this gathering today. But me personally, um, I was honestly feeling a little, a little bit in a creative rut, if you will. Um, and then one day I was working, you know, full time from home and I was like, I just need to do something. I just need to like, get that zhuzh back in my life. Um, and then <laughs> it literally just came out of nowhere. And I was like, I'm gonna put on a conference. I didn't know how I was gonna do it. I didn't know who was gonna be a part of it, but I was just like, this needs to happen. And I was like, well, being that I'm a big beauty person, I know that whatever this conference is, it has to include a beauty aspect. And then I was like, but with the time that we're facing right now, wellness and mental health is very important. Um, a lot of us are, you know, going through a lot mentally and trying to figure out how to navigate in our quote unquote new normal. And I was like, how do I, how do I morph the two? Because honestly speaking, beauty and wellness coexist. They've always coexisted. I don't know why there hasn't been conversation before today. Um, about the the way that beauty and wellness intertwine. And of course, I couldn't think of anyone better. Oh my gosh, what is going on? You birthday popping, that's what's going on. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> I'm so sorry, my apologies. Your birthday popping. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, but yes. I was sitting there and I was like, you know, who am I gonna bring in on this, in this conference? And I was like, my best friend. My best friend is literally someone who 
lives, sleeps, and breathes all things mental health. And I, I've watched her whole journey from, you know, deciding that this is something that she wants to share with the world, because as we all know, it takes a lot of courage to share your journey with hundreds of strangers. Um, and I watched her take her classes, get certified and everything like that. And I was just like, that's it. Like I'm the beauty aspect. She's the wellness aspect. So this all literally started with a text message. Like I texted her and I was like, hey, crazy idea. Um, we should throw a digital conference. Like people yeah. are at home. People need this. It's information that they need. And honestly, it it just skyrocketed from there. I don't think that we both could have imagined that this was going to blow up the way that it did. Like it, it really blows my mind that we have, I can't, like, I can't stop repeating that. We have 16 amazing black women here to greet you, here to welcome you with open arms, here to speak to you, to educate you from literally every, every <laughs> aspect of the <laughs> industries. Like it's, it's amazing to be able to call on dermatologists. It's amazing to be able to call on entrepreneurs. It's amazing to be able to call on public speakers, to call on business owners, and they all be black women. That is something that I really want to pinpoint about this conference. It was literally built with the hands and on the backs of black women. Everything about this conference, just even from the setup that you're seeing right now, like everything from start to finish. Um, and I am so excited to like get this day started, to get this conference started. <sighs> I'm blessed to have you all in my presence. And I really do hope that when you exit this conference that you take something away from it. Well, bouncing off of you, or as they used to say in our school, piggybacking off of you, I, well, first and foremost, you almost made me cry. Don't do that yet, because I just beat my face. But I seriously want to just reiterate and build on what Shah just said. Words can't like begin to express, and I can speak for Shaw and myself, the amount of gratitude that we have that 600 of y'all and still growing, the RSVPs are still growing, that each and every one of you are here, that you told a friend to tell a friend that you knew that it was going to be something great. And the fact that Shaw and I, Shaw had an idea and then we had a vision and then it came to be something so much bigger than we could have ever imagined. Like, Y'all have no idea that what originally started as 100 being the unrealistic goal at the time to less to like 400 less than a thousand is absolutely nuts. And what made me want to really build on this project with Shaw is that, as she said before, I've grown in the mental health and wellness space. I suffer, well, I don't like saying suffer. I live with two mental illnesses, anxiety and depression. And I honestly feel that the conversation of the parallelism between beauty and wellness isn't discussed enough. I believe that I don't feel beautiful if I'm not mentally well. And I don't think that I'm mentally well if I don't feel beautiful and confident. So you can't really have one without the other. They very much so coexist. And the fact that Shaw is bringing all things beauty and confidence and I'm bringing mental health and self-love together. It's going to touch one to all of your lives in so many different ways and not to be all preachy preachy or whatever, but I feel like God speaks through people and I feel like God is going to speak through each and every dope black woman, editor, entrepreneur, um, worker, um, best friend, cousin, everybody is going to be touched by somebody, even if it's somebody that you meet in the comments. Make sure that you really utilize your network and your space. Get to know each other. If you're from New York, like Shaw and I, big ups to New York, put the, what's this, what is it? The Statue of Liberty emoji. If you're from the DMV, put that. This is a space of fellowship and transparency, and it's a safe space. Don't be afraid to cry, don't be afraid to say that something touched you. Don't be afraid to speak up and say that you resonate with somebody else's story. Don't be afraid 
to want to share your story because this is this is what this is about. Brooklyn, New York. Hey, that's me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so we we really do want to extend so much gratitude to each and every one of you for for being here. Like simply showing up is incredible beyond words. So Sean and I really want to thank you. And before before we even go into anything else, yeah, a lot of y'all from New York. Hey, shout yourselves out. I'm gonna put you on the screen. You guys, can I just say one thing? I am so excited about this feature that I can so cool. on the screen. That is amazing to me. Oh my gosh. Like, let's see where else. Oh, we have ATL in the building. I see Miami. I want to be in the beach. Oh, I'm jealous. We got Detroit in the building. After the DMV, my dad is there. DMV. We got Jersey. Who else? Who else? Virginia Beach. We got Miami, Florida. We got South Carolina. Yeah. Hey, I'm in North Carolina right now. Okay, you guys are checking in from all over. That is so exciting. We got another Cali in the building. Charlotte, North Carolina. We got Connecticut. Shout out to the Bronx. Love your hair. Yes, hair. Oh my God, yes, color. <laughs> we have Philly in the building. Oh my God, this is amazing. I am so excited. Georgia. Ooh, that actually is the perfect segue into what we're going to touch on next. Um, actually, Shonda and I, although we're both from New York City, both born and raised, did not know each other existed until we both decided that we were going to attend Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, shout out to Spelman, shout out to the HBCUs. If you're an HBCU grad, let us know, shout yourself out, shout your school out. Um, oh my gosh. So like, do you want to start the story off? Like Shonda like loves to tell this story to everyone because it's- I do. I do. Um, so the story about Shaw and I is that we came in at the same year in college. We were, well, I originally wasn't an English major. I was a biochemistry major, but we're not going to talk about that. And we had always been around the same buildings, kind of sort of knew the same people, but we didn't become friends until senior year. It's not that we didn't like each other. It's not that we had any malice. We just, okay. our, our paths just never crossed. So when we finally met senior year, we met in an elevator, correct? Yeah. We, yeah, we met in the elevator. Back into the dorm at the same time. <laughs> yeah, and, and God just aligned it for it to be so after that. And the friendship literally started with me asking her what the move was for the night, because you know how senior year is. <laughs> I asked her if she moves for the night. And from there, we decided to take like a long, hot summer walk to the Popeyes all the way up the hill. Right out to the west end of Atlanta. <laughs> and then from there, we've, we've just been literally at the hip. Like if you saw one of us, you saw the other one. If you didn't see one of us, the other one knew where we were. Like we were like this and our friendship literally went from same major to associates to friends to close friends to best friends to sisters yeah. in less than a five month span like this girl spent my 21st birthday with me in atlanta didn't know me for for more than five months but she decided to stay an extra week in atlanta with me my cousin and my other best friend taylor to celebrate my legal coming of age so our best friendship has been very quick, very quick, but it's been, it's been like, I, I can't say any word better than flawless. Like, of course, like any other friendship, we have disagreements, we have miscommunications and so on and so forth. But I've never had a friendship of this magnitude before where we kind of just have that weird, like twin-like telepathy. Like she knows if something's wrong with me. I know if something's wrong with her. The fact that we can be best friends, sisters, business partners, because a lot of people can't work together, and just so much more. We've even traveled the world together. Oh my God. Really. Speaking of you guys. So <laughs> before before Corona, 
uh, virus and COVID-19 was a thing. We had like literally just came back from Dubai, which is also where I got this shirt from. And I saw somebody in the comments say, yes, blouse. So, hey, sis. Uh, <laughs> but oh, that was Alexis. Oh, my God. You guys, our panelists for the first session, I'm like, you guys can't see them, but I'm looking at them right now. And they are so excited to speak with you. Oh, whew, I'm so excited. But yes, <laughs> to, the, to the travel tip. Oh, my God. Like. We've literally like been around the world. And and I think it's a true testament of friendships and a true a true testament of relationships when you travel with someone because you learn so much about them. It's just like when you move in with a friend or a significant other, you just learn so many new parts of them. But I can say that like traveling with Shonda had it's it's like it's like, yes, exciting to go to a new place, but to be with one of your closest friends in that new place and you guys are navigating together and you have all these memories with you when you come home, it's just like, it, it truly is an amazing experience. Um, and we just love to tell people how this whole friendship started over like some chicken. <laughs> My chicken was nasty. <laughs> it started you guys over Popeyes at an HBCU, like, black black and more black and we couldn't be prouder to be black women and graduates of Spelman College um who really just helped to mold us into who we are today and we are forever forever grateful our hearts oh like I just I just can't tell you guys about like you know the HBCU experience and in meeting your friends and your future bridesmaids and the godmother of your future children and all of that great stuff. Um, I just, I'm so excited. Like I'm losing the words. <laughs> I'm, I'm I, oh, like, there's like so much energy in my body right now. Like I just want to get up and run around. Um, and I surely will do that when this is all said and done. Um, but like, I like, I have my thoughts on one side and then the other, it's like, don't cry, don't cry. Don't cry because, like I said before, it, it just really means so much to have all of you here with us today and all of you deciding that this is something that you're interested in because we worked extremely, extremely hard to bring you all this amazing conference and the women that you're going to meet throughout the day have also poured their hearts and their souls into these sessions and we couldn't be more grateful of them just believing in this vision. So beyond the panel who is waiting for you, if anybody else later on in the day is watching, we just want to express our sincerest gratitude to you all for just riding this whole wave with us um, and deciding that, you know, you wanna, you know, be a part of the conference and and pour into hundreds of strangers. Honestly, truly, like the we know that the panelists who are watching and those who are going to come in sooner, the fact that you have given us even 30 minutes of your day to bring gems and confidence and self-love and beauty and wellness and all that you have to offer to these incredible women is nothing less than a huge thank you from Shaw and I. We couldn't think of any other women that were more perfect for these panels and these visions that we had. We honestly believe that every single woman that we handpicked for these panels and these keynote speakers and as moderators really fit the bill perfectly. We honestly believe that this wide range of women from nutritionists to journalists to public speakers, to the incredible yoga meditation session that we're gonna have. God, I'm so excited for that. We have something for everybody to be touched. Best believe I'm about to be levitating with the Kelly Green today. We believe that that was gonna be the perfect addition. And then if you all who registered prior to didn't see on Shaw and I social media channels, we have a very, very important keynote speaker and it is actually the founder of Black Girl Sunscreen, Shantae Lundy. And we are super excited to have her for the Black Girls Need Sunscreen 2 keynote speaking. 
moderated by Destiny Davis. We're super excited for that conversation because everybody believes that there are so many different tips and tricks to summer sun care and whatnot, but she has all the tea and all the gems. We can't give that to you because we're not an expert in that. <laughs> so we're so glad that we can give it, that we can give the floor to such an incredible woman and an incredible moderator to really facilitate the conversation. Oh my, I see my HBCU fam in the comment section. Woo-hoo! Want to say hello. Hi, hi, AUC family. Oh my God. Hello. AU is in the building. I know I saw, okay, Hampton in the building. Hello, Hampton. We got Morgan State. Who else is in the building? Actually, actually, actually got Albany State. Let's see, let's see. If you put it before, put it again so we can shout out your HBCU. We are HBCU. Tell us where you went. Tell us what class you graduated from. Shaw and I are technically class of 2017, but we graduated a semester early, so we're December 2016. So even put the year that you graduated. Oh, Winston Salem and A double HBCU. That's lit. Oh, we got Delaware State. We got Bowie. Shout out to y'all. Hello, hello, everyone. We are so excited that everyone is here with us. I like I know I've said that a thousand times already, but we really are super excited. We oh, are we got another Morgan State in the building. Hello. Also, in the comment section, as this um conference takes its course throughout the day please feel free to shout yourself out in the comment section put your name in there put your social media handle tell us what you do because you never know who is in the comment section with you who can benefit from your business who you can collaborate with and all of that great stuff so please 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 network amongst yourselves in the comment sections and i mean you saw how i've been putting the comments on the screen so if you want some free promo right now, you can <laughs> your your business section, tag your business, and get on this big screen so we can know who you are and what you do. Oh, Latoya Young said, my daughter is waving at you, ladies. Hi. Hi. Hey, cutie. <laughs> oh, that's so exciting. Um, what Are, are we going to tell them our fun facts? We I should. Think- we should. You should start off this one since I started off the last one. Hmm. A fun fact about us. It's like so many. Oh, okay. So I know how you all are looking at us right now, right? And my hair looks black. Shonda's braids look like a black brown. Yeah. If you all knew us in college. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, God. It would be like, <laughs> who are these girls in front of us? today i had like bright i wish i could show you i had like bright fire engine red hair yes i too went through my red hair phase and i love the whole little mermaid i didn't care it was it was great like it was amazing to me oh, it was great it looked beautiful on you uh thank you sis and shonda went through this whole like like there was like levels to shonda's blonde phase like it was like regular blonde then it was like platinum blonde then it was like Elsa from Frozen Blonde. It was Elsa Blonde. And then it was like white, silver blonde. Like it was just like, I wish I could like insert a picture, but we were literally known <laughs> around like Atlanta and around the AUC as Blondie and Red because no it didn't joke. matter where we were, like you could spot us in a crowd. And it was just like so funny. Um, one time in the CNN Center, if you're from Atlanta, you know what I'm talking about. We were in the CNN Center and we were waiting for an Uber to pick us up <laughs> and take us back to campus. And this like random person that was like coming out of the CNN Center was like, hey, Blondie and Red. And at this time we were not on the internet going as Blondie and Red at all. It was just like an inside joke between us. So when that happened, we were like, so you know this is a thing, right? Like we can't go right, we'll back apart from this um, as long as we are, you know, in Atlanta and in the AUC, but it was just so funny. Like we, we, you couldn't miss us in the crowd. Like it would be Market Friday if you ever been around Spelman, you know what that is. But it would be Market Friday, and like it would be a sea of people, and then you would just see my like fro, big and red, 
and Shonda the blonde hair. And everybody would just be like, hey y'all. Like, like, hey. And we were like, hey. We could never lose each other. Like she would be at one total end of the student center and I would be all the way at Subway on the other end. And I would call her and be like, where are you? And then she'd be like, I don't see you. I would just look up and see some bright red tresses. And I'd be like, yep, there she, click. Coming your way, sis. Let me shout out some businesses real quick before we move into our first segment. Vanilla Nation. Vanilla Nation, a digital media company for black women. So glad to have you yeah. in the building as we have a whole heap of black women joining us today. We have Latoya Young with L Rose Public Relations. If you need some PR, hit up our sister. We have Milan Mobley. She says, hey everyone, I'm a publicist and business coach. I help experts increase their brand visibility and build profitable sit. Come I'm on, you. six figure brand. I'm gonna need you Milan. Up the Milan Mobley for all <laughs> your PR and business coaching needs because our good sis has you covered. We have Lauren, who is a fashion and self-love blogger. Hit her at name. See what she's doing on the internet. Visit her blog. We have Tasha, the Black Man Digital. She owns a marketing digital agency supporting businesses owned by Black women. I love, I love, I love to see all of us I love in that. the comment section building our brands and building our businesses to help our community, like literally love to see it. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Tamara who is a professional beauty preneur. Come, come on, beauty preneur. She's an MUA and a skincare advocate. So you please stay on for the first panel because we're gonna be talking oh, about you. Things, skincare. Hope you learn something and take it back to your business. Arkea, am I pronouncing that right? I hope so. Please forgive me if I'm not. She is the new faces director at HOP Models. Love that. I Oh my God, the diversity in black women. I see some media here too. I see some writers. I see some podcast hosts. I see some editors. Shout out to the black women journalists who are doing it for real. Come on. Rakia? Rakia. Rakia. It's a content creator and copywriter. Oh, I'm going to hit you up because you know, <laughs> copywriting after this. Hi. Hey. Beauty YouTuber and owns a cosmetic distribution. Come on, That's distribution. That's Hello, awesome. Simone. Hello. Let's see who else we have. We have Court Chanel, who is a millennial mental health specialist. So please stay tuned for our later panels. We're going to be talking about everything. Um, she's a therapist, an event, and content curator. That's incredible. Curating content. We build in six figure brands. And a therapy uh, putting on conferences. We are copywriting. So if you have a blog or a website, hit up our good sisters in the comment section. For Let's sure. see. We have London, who is an entertainment editor and one half of the Let's Talk Creative Podcast. Follow her on Instagram. Go uh, listen to her podcast episodes. Save them. Share them. Let's see. Let's see who else is here. My brown box is here. I love my brown box. Oh, thank you for the sweet message. We are so excited to get um, started with you all in our next session. Let's see, one more, one more before we get the panel started. Ashley says, hi, ladies. I am the creator of Affirmation Society. I help women create magic through words and affirmations. Oh, I love that. It warms my heart because That's I love a good affirmation. You know, I want everybody who's watching this to repeat after me right now, actually. I want you to say, I am enough. I am enough. I have everything I need. I have everything I need to create, to create and execute and execute. The vision I have for my life. The vision I have for my life. And with that, ladies, we will jump into our first panel. I am so super excited to have you all for our skin goals, upping your self-care during quarantine panel. 
I'm gonna pop us off the screen and I'm gonna pop these amazing ladies on so that they can introduce themselves and we can get right into it. Bye y'all. ladies. Hey, hey everybody. Hi everyone. Hi. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I guess I'll go ahead and introduce myself first. Um, I'm Alexis and Alexis D. I, I saw someone I follow on LinkedIn. So, hey, girl, if you recognize me, um, <laughs> I'm the founder of the Lily Speaks and Lily Shea. I'm, it's my skincare company, which is like a specialized shea butter that I made out of a need because I have eczema. And um, I'm just an advocate for wellness and I'm also a model. So that's my brief bio. I'll go next. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Lauren Napier and I am the founder of Lauren Napier Beauty. Um, I am a celebrity makeup artist. I have worked for over a decade, almost two actually, in television, film, and beauty. I created Lauren Napier Beauty because I found that there was a need for uh, fast acting and functional skincare products, but more so because I was so um unimpressed by constant self-deprecation that comes within women when they're not wearing their makeup so our tagline is that there is beauty in taking it off because i want women to feel comfortable and confident in their own skin and i think that's really happening right now um, as we're seeing each other experience um no nails no makeup no hair and uh i'm fully embracing it and i'm loving it too Thank you everybody for coming today. All right, I guess I'll go next. My name is Dr. Lev. I am a dermatologist in New York City. I did my training at Emory University in Atlanta, so I do miss Atlanta. Um, but then I moved to New York um, where I did residency at NYU. And now I currently practice in Gramercy Park in Soho. Um, and I do a combination of medical dermatology and cosmetic dermatology. Awesome. All right. So I'll introduce myself as well. I'm Dr. Karen Kaga. I am a physician also specializing in dermatology. I am a graduating uh, dermatology resident physician finishing this June. Yay. <laughs> um, I have an interest in medical and cosmetic dermatology. I will go on to do a cosmetic fellowship. And um, just one of my passions is just uh, redefining beauty, kind of infiltrating that industry to be more accepting of our type of beauty. I want to help encourage my patients to um, just be confident and feel good in their own skin as well. So I'm excited. All right, that is so awesome. Now I will say that before I got on here, I was kind of stalking each one of y'all's Instagram because I was like, they are so pretty. What do they do? <laughs> so I wanted to all have a base and like just get get to know y'all a little bit better. Um, so I'm gonna go through four sections of questions. I want the first three to kind of be like to get that more medical dermatologist view. And the last one, I really want Lauren's specialty on like the beauty and you know, like everything that you know. So I want to start, um, especially with dryness. Um, right now, we're washing our hands excessively. And um, during quarantine, you know, you're picking up delivery boxes. Well, with me, I pick up my delivery boxes. I'm sanitizing it. Then I'm washing my hands. And we're doing all this stuff, wearing gloves. Um, what, does, what does that do to our skin? Because for me, you know, I've been experiencing eczema coming onto my hands and it dries my my hands out so what does that do to our skin and how can we restore um the moisture or any other natural items that we can do at home that can help with dryness yeah, yeah. so washing the hands in general can be very drying especially depending on what you're washing your hands with we know because of the pandemic that we're experiencing, it's really important to either use soap and water or to use some type of alcohol-based cleanser. So that's just kind of what we have to do. But with that, I have seen both patients who normally have eczema, who may or may not normally have it on their hands, definitely having flares of eczema in their hands, but also people who don't normally have eczema who are um, experiencing eczema on their hands. And that's because soap itself can be irritating. And so if you're constantly being exposed to soap or alcohol, you, you can get something just from the irritation of the product. 
So the two things I recommend is one, if possible, I think we like if you can get it from your grocery store or a delivery, um, switching to a very gentle hand soap like Dove Sensitive Skin or something that has um, more nourishment and more oils that are built into the cleanser. And then the second thing is there are amazing, really thick hand creams that I think are really relevant for using at nighttime before you go to bed or if you're sitting watching TV for three hours, then you can, you know, put on a really thick moisturizer and cover your hands, um, even like put gloves on on top of it. But the most important thing for the fact that we're washing our hands just so many times throughout the day is that you find a really light moisturizer that you like and you use that moisturizer every single time you wash your hands. And so sometimes trying to do the like the best thing. So like trying to use something really thick and really moisturizing isn't it's just not practical because you have to work and you have to type on your computer. So really finding something that you can have next to your desk or have next to your soap that you're just putting on multiple times a day. Yes, those are all great things. I, I agree with that. Um, another thing I think a lot of people are kind of complaining about with the dryness is just overall dryness of the body. You know, we're home a lot. We have kind of our air conditioning or heater, depending on where you are running all the time. So another thing that someone might consider um, adding to their routine, if it's possible, is a humidifier to kind of help with the air that's circulating in your area. And then I get a lot of questions on kind of how we should be showering to kind of help restore them, restore that moisture to your body. So I like to recommend um, avoiding scorching hot water. Try to use lukewarm water if you can, because that's going to dry out your skin less than the hot water would. And then if you can, after you're done showering, try to pat dry and then maybe even have that moisturizer in the shower that you can apply, you know, right away so that you're kind of um, trapping that water in place and sealing that moisture in your skin. Those are um, all great tips that have helped and my patients benefit from that too. And that's, that's definitely a good point about the humidifier. I was really excited when you mentioned that because I, um, on my, my um, YouTube, The Lily Speaks, my production company, I've been making a docu-series about eczema. And um, one of the newer episodes that I have is about a humidifier that I, that I have. And um, just testing it out. And since getting it, I realized that during this pandemic, that's helped me a lot, especially putting like essential oils in it, like lavender or lemon oil that's helped to create a space to where even if I have to wash my hands so much, I'm not as irritated as I would be if I hadn't used it. So I think those are really some awesome points. Um, makes me feel like I'm on the right track with what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to see, let's see. Ooh, pedicures. This is, this is a good one because a lot of us, you know, we're out here with some crusty feet and, you know, we got to learn some stuff. So we can't get ped pedicures or a lot of us aren't going to the pedicure shop I'm in Atlanta, so our governor has opened us up and, you know, people are still going. But for a lot of us, we're staying home. So we're, we can't get pedicures. Our heels are dry. What can we do to keep our feet and our heels um, moisturized? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lauren. Um, all right. So I have got to say that I was experiencing some really dry, scary feet. It was like I put... <laughs> When I say scary, I'm like, am I at the zoo now? Um, I was calling my mom. I'm like, what? Like, I had to, I was digging deep. And what I discovered was I use, one, I'm taking extra hot showers too. And I think the shower water is even really hot for my feet. And I was um, using moisturizer and things like this at night. Um, Y'all, it wasn't working. But I found a mask from Patchology, a foot mask that bad boy completely worked and then i'm using um hannah hannah which is a very rich thick black woman owned uh skincare moisturizer lotion cream body butter it worked wonders and now my feet are like back to pristine salon condition so patchology and hannah hannah really worked my feet over that's my suggestion <laughs> yeah that's that's all like really I yeah. yeah, that sounds like really great suggestions. Um, so this is an amazing time to do, there's something called baby feet. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, um, but it's a peel that you put on your feet and then it causes basically 
the top surfaces of your skin, like very deep, not super deep, but definitely exfoliation of those outer surfaces of the foot to exfoliate. The only problem is it's like sold out on Amazon right now and back ordered because I think a lot of other people realize that it was a really good time to do baby feet. Because the problem is your feet really do peel for two weeks. But then after those two weeks, you have like the softest feet you'll ever have. Other than that, adding a product that either has urea or lactic acid, something that's exfoliating um, to your skincare routine, especially for the feet. And so Eucerin makes one that has um, urea and lactic acid. It's like made for actually rough and bumpy areas and you can apply it specifically to the calluses. Apply that to the calluses. I'm like a tried and true like fan of Vaseline. I know people have feelings about it, um, but using some type of ointment on the foot um, and then if you can put socks on it. So it's a good thing to do before you go to sit down at your desk and work for the full day because you can have that like exfoliation and that nourishment happening while you're getting stuff done. Yeah, I love Vaseline. I use it all the time. I use it on my hands. I use it on my lips, <laughs> my feet. Um, and I, I love what Dr. Love said about putting that on at night, especially um, when you're before you go to bed and then even putting socks on it. Some of my patients that have really bad hand eczema, sometimes I'll recommend that they put that on their hands and even put cotton gloves over that at night since it may not be as practical to do that during the day. But another thing I like for the feet, um, like Dr. Love said, something that includes the acid in it. So I like amlactin is another one that you can check out and see if that's available. And then another one that I've really liked and have had great reviews for my patients is um, CeraVe it has an SA uh, foot cream. It's like blue and white. So you can check and see if that's available too. Yeah, those are those are some really nice tips because I was just looking into on Amazon for like this foot peel. So like when the foot peels, Dr. Love, since this is your point, when you put the foot peel on, like it just peels the skin. It like Yeah, so it the the one I'm specifically the one I the reason I said baby feet is because there are a lot of them on Amazon and the one problem is they don't they're not very honest with like disclosures of what's in them. So that's one that like I know is like safe to use. Um, but it has a combination of these like of a combination of these acids. And so you leave it on the feet for I can't remember like uh, 30 minutes or something. And it's almost similar to if you were going to do a very light, they make some at home chemical peels where like 30 minutes you take it off but it you do get considerable peeling of the top layers of the skin over the next two weeks so that's why i specifically said baby feet because i know that's one that like we know is reputable but yeah. okay that is awesome now i know i'm gonna stock up my amazon cart and I'm gonna be ready to go. My feet are not gonna be crap. Just don't do it before. Like the reason is don't do it like before beach trip because you will be embarrassed. Or like before yoga, <laughs> like you will be embarrassed. So will it hurt to it doesn't it tingles a little, but it doesn't hurt. Okay. It's just more kind of shocking to the eye. So you're saying, okay, so if I go to the beach and two weeks before I use the peel, not to like it, that's fine but don't okay. use the peel and then go to the beach five days later because okay. people are gonna like look at you like you're crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, what's going on with her feet like what is she doing <laughs> oh my gosh y'all have dropped some, some good gems i wanted to um kind of shift it over to eczema now which is my passion i've had it my entire life um just to kind of give you just a little background can yeah my mic is on um, just to give a little bit of background, I've tried topical steroids. Um, I had maybe last year a really bad breakout on my face, which um, had weeping eczema. And I went on a journey to say, you know what, I'm going to heal myself naturally. And I've seen some results with that. And um, yeah, so let's get into the eczema portion. Um, what is eczema? What causes it? And um the tip, what are the different types of eczema? I've done some research for myself, but I would love to hear um, just from you ladies what, what it is and what the different types are and everything. So just to repeat the question, what is eczema, what causes it, and the different types of eczema? So I'll start. <laughs> eczema is kind of a, a big category. Um, basically, you get inflammation in the skin. You have a kind of 
your uh, the epidermis or the barrier of the skin is abnormal. And so there are, it's a, a broad term to describe a lot of different type of rashes, but it's multifactorial. So some people have a genetic component, there's an environmental component, your immune system is playing a role too. So I like what you said about kind of your experience, Alexis, um, that I think that's a key point is that everyone is gonna be a case by case basis. Everyone responds differently to our treatment. Um, depending on the type of eczema you have, it may be more common in a different age group. They all present differently, but the, the, we're basically treating the same skin and trying to restore that normal skin barrier because the skin is the largest organ of our body and it gives us that natural protection. So mainstay of treatment, we do typically start uh, with topical steroids to try and heal um, that skin barrier. There are some other um, anti-inflammatories that are non-steroidal that we can use sometimes, especially for areas on the face. If patients are not responding or we want to avoid using a prolonged um, um, course of steroids in that area. Um, and then depending on how you respond, there may be other things that contribute to it. So for instance, there's a category that we call allergic contact dermatitis. Depending on what someone may be putting on their skin, we can do as much treatment as we, you know, as we choose to, but if they're still putting that thing that's driving the rash, then they're not going to clear. So it, it is kind of a complex topic that is kind of an umbrella term for a lot of different types of rashes, um, but everyone responds differently and it's kind of a case by case basis. Well, Dr. Love, what do you have to add? No, yeah, I completely agree. I have this conversation, I think multiple times a day, but I pretty much kind of bucket eczema, I'm basically repeating what you said, into like three different categories. There is like the inherent form of eczema. So people who are usually born with eczema, they've had it since they were a little kid and it, sometimes it goes away as they get older, but sometimes it persists. Sometimes it presents in adulthood too. There is a type of eczema that is allergic based. So it's not that you inherently have eczema, but your skin has formed a reaction to something that's coming in contact with your skin. This can be really tricky to figure out because you're never born allergic to any type of skincare product. It has to be something that you've been using for a considerable amount of time before you become allergic to it. So whenever people come to me, especially with facial rashes, and I suspect that they're allergic to something, they're like, but I haven't changed anything in my skincare routine. And I'm like, well, that's actually probably right, because it's something that your body has seen multiple times, and then we started to respond to. And then the third category is what we were talking about when we were talking about washing your hands. And that's just if you're using something that's drying and irritating over and over and over, you can get a type of irritation, um, eczema. The thing to note is that all of these things can happen in the same person. And so there are some people where they are, especially people who are naturally prone to eczema, they're more likely to get allergy-based eczema rashes and they're more likely to get irritation-based rashes. But there are some people who have no history of eczema and now are getting irritation-based rashes because they're washing their hands all the time. So it, it does take a little bit of like sitting down, kind of figuring out what's going on, what's responding to what. Sometimes. Usually if someone presents initially with a rash, we say, I say, let's treat this, let's get it to go away. But if it continues to recur and recur and recur, that's when we kind of have to sit down and kind of figure out, are there things that we can take out? And this may be, this sounds supportive of what you kind of went through. Are there things that we can help you avoid that you will stop getting rashes? We do have something in the office called patch testing that can help with that. So we test your skin to a bunch of different ingredients that are commonly included in skincare products. Because if you look at the back of a lot of skincare products, there's like 40 ingredients. Um, and we can kind of see if you're allergic to any of those ingredients, because it's usually not, oh, I'm allergic to this one product. It's usually I'm allergic to this ingredient that's in five products that I use on different areas of my body. And that's another reason why sometimes it can be difficult to, um, kind of figure out. Okay, <clears throat> that was that's very helpful. Um, so what would we say for like, what would a shower routine look like for 
I guess for a regular person or even a person who's experiencing that inflammation on the skin, um, yeah. How would we, how would a shower routine look? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, starting out kind of from a preventive standpoint is always the best route to go as much as we can. So I, I touched on it just a little bit earlier, but um, typically I recommend uh, short, keeping your showers as short as possible. I mean, obviously, you know, focusing on the hair bearing regions that are going to have more odor. Um, and then for the rest of your body, keeping it as short as possible, um, using gentle soaps. So Dove is one that I like to recommend. People who do have eczema or are more eczema prone, if you can, use products that don't have fragrance. It's one of the more common allergens. Um, along the category that Dr. Love mentioned earlier, but trying to pick a shower wash that doesn't have fragrance would be more helpful as well. And then again, um, back to the, temp the water temperature, the water temperature plays a role. Um, so trying to do lukewarm showers, I know the hot showers feel really good, but they tend to dry your skin out more. So the top kind of pointers are keeping the shower short, using lukewarm water, avoiding products that have fragrance. And then again, if you can keep a moisturizer in the shower so that as soon as you pat dry, you can put that slather that moisturizer all over your body to try to lock that, that moisture into your skin. Those are gonna help everyone across the board, but especially people that have more eczema prone skin. Wow, that's, that's very informative. And I know that's very helpful information. Um, let me kind of switch it on to um, makeup and since we're on skincare and shower routines and everything, um, I know Lauren has like this really great company. Um, uh, Lauren, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce your last name right, uh, Napier. Lauren Napier Beauty. It's an incredible um, line of beauty and I just love what you're about. Um, tell me a little bit about um, some skincare. I know you have these amazing makeup wipes, so. Um, give us a little bit insight on your knowledge on skincare and makeup and everything. Thank you uh, for asking. So my uh, my collection is Learning Your Beauty, and it is a collection of high performing makeup remover wipes. I created them because there was a need for a fast acting and functional makeup remover wipe. Most makeup remover wipes have a lot of unnecessary, harsh filler ingredients in them that don't that can. Uh, disrupt your complexion. They're not necessarily helping remove makeup for your, from your skin, but, you know, kind of adding to the things that are just on your face. So when I created Lauren Napier Beauty, I made sure that the formula was designed to, um, to clean, to nourish, and also to hydrate. So the main ingredient is water. There's a coconut derivative that helps to break down the oils and also uh, oil-based makeup that appears on your skin. There are, it's marshmallow root extract, chamomile, cucumber, um, that helps to remove eye makeup without irritating your eye or pulling your skin or even disrupting your lashes. So if you're wearing false lashes um, or if you have more um, like long wear lash extensions, it's not gonna pull and strip your lashes, but it's going to clean that eye area. So it's ideal for uh, that dermatologist, ophthalmologist, call and claim that most uh, most makeup wipes have. It's gonna help to clean that area effectively. But when we talk about skin, we're here talking to two, two dermatologists and I'm always ex excited to, to be in their presence. Um, so much of my brand is designed on really empowering women to feel good about themselves with and without their makeup, but also to nourish and to feed the skin and the skin condition. So as I move forward with my next generation of products, it will always be about empowering women to feel good, but also to care for and to, um, like, like I said, to nourish, balance, to treat your skin. It's your longest organ. It's your calling card. People see it first. So we want to take care of our skin. Um, and that's not just face, but that's face and body. What's the what's your Instagram for your um your line? We need to get in contact with you. Girl. I know. Okay, the Instagram is Lauren Napier Beauty. So it's my first and last name. Uh, you guys, and thank you for asking because um I didn't add it. <laughs> um yeah, and so I mean it just the the genesis really of the brand was I'm a girl who's always on the go. I'm always going somewhere, got somewhere to be, and I wanted to make sure that if I can't carry my full skincare routine. I've got something in my bag that is designed to 
remove all of my makeup. Um, it's manufactured with solar energy. It's cruelty free and um, it's biodegradable. So you can also feel good environmentally when you're using the wipes as well. So it's like a two in one. Oh, just through two in one. Um, I really enjoyed this um, conversation. Do we have any any uh, questions from the audience of, about anything that was said? I know someone asked about something about what mask, a foot mask or something. I think Lauren mentioned a foot mask. The foot mask that I used was from Technology. Um, I, it was really, I actually saw it on Instagram. I had also heard of Baby Feet, but it, they're sold out. But Patch Out it really did work. Like I promise you guys, it's not an ad. I it, I used it and it really did work. I had to use my like foot scrubber, but hey, it did so it did a number. And I'll post it later on my Instagram so you can see it. I'm looking at y'all's comments. Thank you. I see people talking about the ones that we use. Thank you. And yes, that is the one that I recommended. Oh, and then I'm sorry, guys. So I can you can find Lauren Napier Beauty at laurennapier.com. So it's L A U R E N N A P I E R dot com. And if you use code twenty, you get twenty percent off. What's the best products for lip treatment? Vaseline. I love Vaseline. Cocoa butter. Um, so I think it depends on your skin. If you're more acne prone, especially more oily, I tend to avoid any kind of oils or thick creams to the face, anything that's going to be um, comedogenic or clogging the pores. I like to um, kind of stay away from that category. Um, some people have uniform or unicorn skin, and so they can put anything on their skin and still be okay. But typically, people come for us, come to us because they have issues that they want to fix. And so we see a lot of acne. It's very common. Um, a lot of people will deal with it in their lifetime. So I try to stay away from those types of products. What about you, Dr. Lou? Do you? I completely agree with everything you said. I have actually never heard of mango butter, so <laughs> I cannot even comment on this. <laughs> yes, it sounds thick though, it has butter in it, so I would probably say the same thing about it. I like black soap. I've had acne and black soap has helped me. That's a natural. I'm not sure what the doctors say about it, but I know for me and my personal experience, um, black soap has helped me. And um, I have tried mango butter for the mango butter option that has helped my skin as well um, with eczema that I have. And yeah, my butter's out. <laughs> that helps too. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think the line of like what's considered natural versus clean like gets a little confusing, but I like a line called Crude Beauty, which is like a small, like really small company. They're based in Brooklyn. It is an oil-based product, which I tend to stay away from oils in general, but it's hard to go natural without going with oils. Um, so it's not something that I recommend like top priority, but if staying with a natural cleanser is your top priority, that's the one that I recommend. That is like a 15-minute discussion. <laughs> We yeah, did, I actually did an Instagram. I did a live on my Instagram. It's in stories on skin of color. And we talk about under eye circles for like 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Very complex. Multiple things that can be contributing. Okay. Well, thank you all for those, um, those questions. Um, yeah, really appreciate all this informative information. I love speaking with um, Lauren, your amazing company, Dr. Love, Dr. Kaga. Yeah, did I pronounce that right? Yes, you got it. Yes. Hey, and I'm like from Nigeria. I love. Hey. hey back to my yes. Um, but yeah, just thank you guys for everything. I really enjoyed our conversation, get to know y'all a little bit, and um, I think that pretty much wraps up our our session. Um, 
Yeah. I'm going to say this. I'm going to answer some of the questions in the comments too. So um, I see a lot of really good questions on like skincare and cosmetic, the cosmetic aspect of it. So I'll be in there answering questions. Thank you. Don't want to interrupt. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was going to say thank you to you, Alexis, for moderating this whole thing. It's been a joy and yeah. really easy. <laughs> you did all the hard work. <laughs> yeah, definitely enjoyed connecting with you all, ladies. Definitely stick around for the rest of the conference. And again, thank you to the amazing founders of this conference for bringing us all together. Absolutely. Yeah. And happy birthday, Sha. <laughs> yes, happy birthday. Yes. <laughs> Gemini season. <laughs> oh. Can you hear me now? That's awkward. Yes. Sorry. But I was <laughs> saying it is Gemini season. And we thank you all so much for the gems that you have dropped. Please go follow them on their social media handles. And we are going to slide right into the next session. Bye, ladies. Thank Bye. you again so much. Thank you. <laughs> everybody, hello, hello. Tell me if everybody can hear me and see me perfectly. The next panel we have that I will be moderating is Black Women, Self-Love, and Mental Health During COVID-19. We all know that this is a wicked, crazy time, to say the least. And it's very introspective, especially for myself knowing what you like, what you don't like, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, especially indoors. So I'm super excited to bring forward the women who are going to be part of this panel. I'm so excited for this because as Shaw said before, I'm all things self-love, mental health and awareness. And I feel like everybody is going to learn something a bit more about themselves in this panel. And that's what makes this very unique. You're gonna walk away with tips and tricks for managing your anxiety for ways to take care of yourself, your inside as well as your outside. And these incredible women who are coming on, if you guys don't know them already, it's Siobhan Jones, Olaniki Osi, and Andromeda Peters. Hi. We have these beautiful women here now. Hi, everyone. I'm gonna pop off and let you ladies do your thing. Hello. Bye. Hi, everyone. How are you all doing? Amazing. Good, good, good. I was just telling everybody that I'll be moderating this conversation and I'm super excited to have each and every one of you here. And I know that a lot of people are just now popping in. So we're going to start with a few intros with myself. I'm Deshonda Brown. I am the co-founder and co-curator of the BBW Con. I am a mental health advocate, journalist, publicist, and suicide attempt survivor. So this conference is very near and dear to my heart because I believe that you can't have beauty without wellness and you can't feel well if you don't feel beautiful and confident. So moving forward with the introductions, next we'll have Siobhan, then we'll have Olaniki, and then we'll have Andromeda. Good, good afternoon. I was about to say good morning. <laughs> I am Siobhan Jones. I am a social worker here in Atlanta, Georgia. I am a suicide prevention specialist. Um, I am the founder of the Mental Wellness Collective, which is an online community designed to help women prioritize their mental health. Um, I've been in the mental health space probably for over 10 years now, working with children, families, women, really just helping them to understand their mental health, find ways to improve their mental health, and get onto a, a way that they can prioritize and balance and move forward in life. So I'm excited to be here with all of you. We're excited to have you. Thank you. And then Olaniki, you're up next. Hi, beautiful. Um, my name is Olaniki Osi. I am the founder of the self-love app called Selfish Babe, as well as the founder and CEO of Goddess Detox, which is my women's wellness company. I'm so happy to be here. And then last but certainly not least, Andromeda. Good afternoon, everyone. I almost said good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Andromeda. I am former Miss United States. I'm also a model and a licensed psychotherapist and mental health coach. Um, I like to pull in different streams of life coaching and traditional mental health to help people with keeping a healthy mindset and accomplishing a lot of their goals. 
outside of a traditional therapy room. Um, as a therapist, I specialize in mindfulness and PTSD. And as a model, it's really important for me to bring in all of these healthy tips and advocacy to make sure that we are navigating the industry in a very healthy way for everyone. So really, really excited to be here. We're excited to have all of you. And as you all can see, we have a very diverse group of panelists from all different walks of life. We're so blessed and so thankful to have each and every one of you here to offer your expertise dropping those gems, giving major keys, and changing somebody's life here. So mm -hmm. jumping straight into the conversation, I know that there's a billion and five ways, but what are some ways in which you can manage your anxiety during COVID-19? Because I know that a lot of people are probably experiencing, probably at this point, level five stir craziness. Some people don't know how to keep themselves busy or some people are keeping themselves too busy. So what are some yeah. ways that you can suggest managing anxiety? Deshonda, can I just go? I'm sorry? I can go? Yes. I just wanted to offer the collective some sage before we got started, just so that we can clear the energy. So I just want to make sure for any, any of you guys watching here, some sage, okay? Because I know we're about to get into it today. Yes. I will sage myself as well. And uh, for anyone of you wondering, I'm drinking some watermelon juice. It's not alcohol. just want to let you know. Um, but in terms of uh, managing anxiety during this time, one thing I think is super, super important is that um, women get back into their spiritual baths and using herbs. And so what do I mean by that? So for me, um, everything is, is energy. Everything is energy. And so especially when managing anxiety and stress, a lot of times we're watching the news, which I really don't suggest. Yes, keep up to date, but I really don't suggest watching news every single day. But we're watching the news and we're getting a lot of um a lot of fear coming through, but not only within ourselves, but from the rest of the collective. And so for me, it's like, well, how, how do we handle that? For me, spiritual baths have been very important in my self-love de development because I like understand the power of my words. I know I'm speaking something that's energy, but also the herbs, specific herbs have the properties to cleanse you, to cleanse negative emotions, to cleanse stress, to cleanse some anxiety. And one thing that I really want to make sure anybody is watching here today is to know this very, very simple spiritual bath that you can do. And the ingredient of this spiritual bath is basil. Basil is a wonderful, in terms of spiritual and, and the energy that basil has, it's a wonderful energetic cleanser. And so for the woman out there, I want you to go get some basil. I want you to get some cold spring water. Do not get distilled or purified. Get spring bottled water. Get the basil, put it in a bowl. And I want you to kind of um, move the herbs with your hands like this in the water. As you continue to do that, the water is going to turn green. As you are doing this, I want you to think, what do you want this spiritual bath to do for you, right? So you wanna start saying your affirmations. You wanna say, I am peace. I am feeling safe. I am calm. I'm relaxed. I wash away any of the fear and anxiety that does come up. And you want to speak the things that you wish to see because the words that you are speaking are going energetically into that spiritual wash that you are preparing for yourself, including you having your intention into that bath. And so after you get the basil and you have the water, what I want you to do you can go take a bath, like, you know, with your roses and the Epsom salt. That's cool. But you don't necessarily need to have a bathtub to do this. After you get out of your shower and you have that water, I want you to take that water with a white rag or in your hand, and I want you to wash it over your body while thinking the good thoughts, while having the intention of what you wish to receive, while saying some specific affirmations. And if you don't have any affirmations, definitely download my free app, Selfish Babe, to get some. But that water, I more than likely want you to have it cold. And in the beginning, you're going to be like, wow, Super cold, I don't like cold water, but when that cold water washes over you and washes over your body, you're going to have an instant transformation. I promise you, you're going to feel better. And for the woman, I would highly suggest uh, to have it poured on your head as well. I have locks, but sometimes when I used to wear like different wig wigs and weaves, I say that sometimes it's good to take that off so that water touches your head because um, a lot of the times we're carrying all that in our head and energetically we're not clearing that away. And so energetically, a good way to do that is to use the basil bath water that you've already prayed over and you wanna wash it over your head and your body. Then you're gonna want to towel dry 
And then you're going to want to go to bed and wear something light colored or white. Um, and you don't want to have too much interaction with other people because you are cleansing yourself and you're trying to get in a nice space. Now, for some women, they may have some dreams. Definitely have your journal next to your bed to write those down. But one thing I highly, highly suggest is taking that basal spiritual bath and you do not need a bathtub. That's my suggestion. I love that. I love that. And Andromeda, I know that I saw you nodding your head and whatnot during what Olaniki was saying. What are some ways that you suggest that everybody in the comments can practice self-love and manage anxiety during COVID? Yeah, I definitely agree. I'm all about energy. I think it's also important to understand anxiety. Um, Mel Robbins, I love the way that she identifies it. She says that anxiety um, worrying is a mental state and anxiety is a physical agitated state. So mm. our body starts to believe that something's actually wrong. That's when we experience triggers and our minds believe that too, like we're preparing for danger. So a really important thing is to make sure that we are aware of our habit of negative self-talk and any negative thoughts that come with that. Um, I really like the suggestion. I also advocate for this, not watching the news all the time. I like to check out the CDC website instead because our anchors are also human. So they are also going in with their anxious energy and their fear as well, because we're human and that's just what happens naturally. So making sure that right. you're getting your updates that way. Um, but to really look at your thought patterns in particular, and I like to really help my clients with this um, acronym ANTS, automatic negative thoughts. And some examples of those thoughts are should statements, I should work out, I should eat healthy, mm -hmm. or catastrophizing, like going from this one situation to the absolute worst case scenario, or future tripping when you're so focused on what possibly could happen is all those what if statements. So it's really important to start to be aware of what those automatic negative thoughts are first and then help on reframing that. And I like to say it's a way of like reparenting our mind and reparenting our thoughts because we're coming from origins and thought patterns that are from childhood, earlier messages that we got and we have to correct those messages in adulthood. So a thought record is a really, really great way to help you do this. That essentially is writing down the thought. So one example might be, I am useless. Okay, so then what's the evidence to support that thought? I have this long to-do list. I haven't done laundry. I haven't exercised. I haven't called this person back. Because of that, I'm feeling like I am not adequate. Where do those thoughts come from? Maybe as a kid, I got yelled at for not making my bed, or maybe I had an abusive mm -hmm. um, parent or a neglectful childhood. Maybe I had a teacher who gave me all these negative thoughts about myself. Okay, so then what is the evidence against that? Okay, so here's where I am in my career. I'm a graduate, I'm a good friend, I'm a good cousin, I'm a good aunt. Whatever my role is, I can look at that to validate actually the things that I can offer to other people as well as myself. And then how can I reframe that thought? So even though I haven't been able to do all these things on my to-do list, I'm thankful that I have the desire to want to do a little bit more. I'm gonna start small and start to pace myself and take little steps towards that specific goal. So it's really important to tune in in the first place. Sometimes we function on autopilot. We have no idea what we're thinking in the first place. So taking time out is really important. I really advocate for having a routine. When you first wake up in the morning before you go to sleep, your subconscious mind is the most easily influenced because there's less chatter. So making sure that whatever you're putting into your mind is going to serve you really well. So before bed, I like to use um, my, I have it in my pocket right here, some good smelling stuff, some essential oils right yes, here. This is lavender. <laughs> I diffuse it or I put it on my wrist and I can just smell it and take in all that good stuff. Um, I like to meditate, whether it be just sitting in silence for 10 or 20 minutes or a guided meditation. YouTube has thousands of guided meditations that are really helpful. It can even be fun just to spend hours trying to find ones that work for you and bookmark them. Um, Calm app, Headspace, all these apps are also very, very helpful too. Um, and getting some really good movement and some mindful movement. Sometimes we exercise our bodies out of punishment for eating something that we shouldn't have. Another ant there, the shit statement, but really moving, moving your body because it feels good to move and wanting to honor yourself with some movement, whether it be yoga or Tai Chi, whatever you can find also on YouTube as well is very, very helpful. And then making sure that every hour you make sure that you take a time out to ask yourself what you're experiencing. What am I experiencing physically? What am I experiencing emotionally? Because a lot of our anxiety also comes from having an unmet need. So taking time out to really like sit in and, and evaluate what's coming up for you in the first place is really important. Eating your meals on time as well. Nutrition does play a very big role in our anxiety levels, making sure that you're putting food in your body that's not too stimulating, um, food that's not going to agitate your GI, and keeping our immune system high, as we know, is the very most important thing that we can do for ourselves right now as well. So those are my little tips for anxiety. No, those were definitely great tips. And Siobhan, I'm going to throw it over to you now because what Andromeda said that really touched with me is 
reparenting your mind and of childhood trauma. And I really want to talk about the advice that you as a social worker and somebody who's very big in the mental health space has has advice for anybody who may be staying with toxic family members or maybe they're quarantined with somebody who they're not having the best relationship right now or maybe they're stuck in an area where a lot of family members or friends or even they're still working from home and that's a trigger for them. So what advice do you have for anybody that's staying in a toxic situation and can't necessarily leave? So that is including people who may be staying with their abuser. That includes people who may be staying with lovers who aren't exactly in the best relationship. Maybe it's roommates who have like a toxic friendship. So what advice do you have for that, for putting your mental health first and really creating a safe space for your mind when staying with somebody toxic? Absolutely. Um, and the first thing I want to say, if anybody is dealing with abuse, um, I definitely think that that's a separate issue because we definitely want people to stay safe and finding ways for you to stay safe to get out of that situation. Um, but as far as being able to, you know, with family members or people who are just, you can't get, a, we can't get away from them during this time. I think back. Oh, Siobhan, I think you were going in and out. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I said boundaries are important. Um, I think that it's so important to um, establish those boundaries and for people to know that you don't have to deal with any situation, answer any questions that you don't want to answer. You don't have to deal with anybody for a prolonged period of time just because you're stuck in the house with them. So separating yourself, finding time, alone time to spend by yourself, um, understanding that it's OK to be selfish. It's OK. Uh -oh. yourself and need time. Um, I think I advocate for boundaries. Siobhan. Can you hear me? Yes, you were going in and out. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's okay, you were going I don't know why it's doing that. <laughs> gotcha. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think that boundaries are really important um, when, when dealing with people in a home that you can't get away from. And then this is open to any of the panelists. A lot of us are working from home, whether it be freelance work or working on an app or working on social media, or even as Shaw does, she works nine to five for Good Morning America. A lot of us are mothers. I'm not a mother, but I know that a lot of panelists and people who are here are mothers. Some people are aunties, some people are wives, some people are best friends, some people are caretakers, but we don't really get a chance to check in with ourselves as much as we should. I personally can admit that I don't ask myself how I'm doing as often as I believe that one should. I feel like, especially as black women and women of color, we're so prone to asking everybody else how they're doing and asking everybody else what they need and asking everybody else how can we serve them instead of asking ourselves the same question. So anybody can answer this question. How do we as black women or how do we as women of color in general or women put the needs of others before ourselves and how do you believe that we can combat that? Either of you. <laughs> I'll wait for Angel, you can go last. No, no, it's, <laughs> all right. Um, I think it's also, it's, it's really important for us to understand the origin of why we as black women or just black people as a whole have the thought process, the way that we do with getting help. Um, there's a lot of intergenerational trauma. We're all very intelligent. We all very much know the history of black people here in this country. So if you look back to what our great, great grandparents experienced, there was no validation. There was not even being acknowledged as a human being in the first place. So really understanding that component, I think allows us to have a little bit more compassion for the thought processes that our relatives have. Sometimes it's easy for us to just have a react um, a reactive thought or a reactive kind of interaction with them that isn't the healthiest because we might lose patience, we might be short fused. At that point, our window of tolerance is so small because of all of the stimulation from the news around COVID. So understanding that component, understanding our origin really can help us navigate all of this, but accepting that the reality is that we're going to be the trendsetters in our families. We're going to stop the cyclical um, traumatic thought process. Um, traumatic behavior, the way that we treat one another, the way that we hold space for ourselves, and kind of accepting that we're taking that responsibility on. 
um, as spearheading actually bringing in more mental health conversations in our communities in general. So I think it starts with being vulnerable, accepting your vulnerability as yourself, allowing yourself to be vulnerable with people in your life. It can even be a conversation of, I don't quite know how to be vulnerable, but I have these needs that I'm not sure how to quite get those needs met. Working with your therapist on that as well can help you go through the process and why it's difficult to be a person in need rather than a giver. And really examining your role within your families. You know, are you a caretaker? Are you the scapegoat? Really kind of going into that kind of discussion as well, especially in therapy, is really, really helpful. And then looking at your other relationships, because at the same time, the attachments that we form with family might differ from the attachments that we have in a professional setting or with our romantic relationships or in friendships. So it's really important to examine our role in each of these case scenarios and then spending time with yourself, right? And actually figuring out what those needs are. I know I mentioned this before, but taking a break every hour to ask yourself, what are my needs right now in this, in this, in this situation? When I go to the bathroom, looking at yourself in the mirror, we go to the bathroom probably like a few dozen times a day. When you're washing your hands, look yourself in the eye. What do I actually need for myself right now in this given moment and how can I meet my own need? Once we can actually sit with the fact that we can be vulnerable, because sometimes that space is really difficult to be in, then we can then allow other people to hold space for us. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you so much, Antonia. I agree with that. Um, I think you really hit it on the head when you're talking about asking asking us ourselves what do we need in this moment. Um, now, this, since this question is specific specifically for Black women, I would say that when it comes to black women, especially in America, just globally, um, she is seen as like the superwoman. She is seen as the one that carries the whole family. Um, it's always usually in survival mode. And we're always have been forced to be put into roles of caretaker, even taking care of other people's families that don't look like us, such as breastfeeding white yeah. children that were not our children, right? So in terms of black women, I think that um, in our genetics, there is something called post-slavery tra uh, traumatic disorder. And yep. I think that in our DNA that, um, I think it's very true that some of us do have that still in our DNA. And so during these times, um, we have to make it a habit of not working so hard, of not giving so much. And I can talk about this from my own personal experience because I'm a person that I like to describe myself as a go-getter. I'm a very action-oriented person. If I have a goal, I'm going to do it, boom, boom, boom. But right now in this time, I'm currently 28, but in this time, I'm more focused on working with my feminine energy. The go, 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 get it, that's usually a lot of a masculine energy. We, we all have masculine and feminine energies in us, but I really like worked out my uh, masculine energy. So now I'm in a time where I'm focused on my feminine energy and I have to force myself to slow down. I have to force myself to understand that the rest of the, the world is not going to fall. And so about a few weeks ago, and this is also advice, I took my spiritual bath, but this time it wasn't a basil bath. It was an actual, I'm going to get in the bathtub. I had a whole bunch of herbs in the bath. Like I, I really nourish my spirit body with the herbs and my words of prayer and affirmation. And so I get into my bathtub, I have my herbs, I lit a candle in honor of myself, and I have my journal. I'm in darkness except for that candle. I get into the tub saying that this, this is for me, this is my me time. And I sit into the bathtub and I wait. I'm in silence. And I wait and I see what comes to mind because what, and I did this again yesterday last night. We know a lot of times exactly what it is that we need. I liked when Andrew Media talked about asking ourselves, what do we need? But we honestly know. And a lot of times it's in those moments of silence when we're not doing anything for anyone else but ourselves is when the answers come to us. But when we're always doing and giving and putting out an exertion and not taking moments of silence, then those answers cannot come to us. And then we're confused. And then we're like, well, I don't even know what I like. That's not good. You should know exactly what, I curse. Can I curse? Okay. <laughs> like I just I'm trying to like stop myself from not cursing, but like I curse. Like we shouldn't, we should know exactly what the fuck we like. Like if you don't know, that's a problem. And so it's like, well, how can you fix the problem? The problem is to get with yourself because you have the answers inside of you. You're just not taking the time. You have to forcibly take the time. Like for me, I understand. I'm not a mother right now, but I understand. Having kids at home, 
having a husband or a wife or whomever you're loving at home. But in order for them to realize, for you to show up as your best self, you need to take the time. You have to take the time. You cannot show up as your best self for your family and kids or anybody else if you don't take the time. And so I took the time last night. I took my bath. And I was having a conversation with myself because some things came up in my mind that I'm like, I want to, I want solutions to this. What, what do I need to do? My higher self, I say soul self comes through and she guides me and she lets me know exactly what I need to do for myself. But if I wasn't taking the time, then I would not know. I wouldn't know what I need to do. For, I would just be in confusion or making rash decisions without sitting and consulting with myself first. And for some people, that can be their ancestors. For some people, that can be God. That can be goddess. That can be creator. It doesn't matter whatever your spiritual practice is, even if you don't believe in anything but yourself, you are consulting with who you are right now. And so my thing when it comes to black women and, and self-love and mental health is we not taking enough time. We have to force that shit. You have to force time for yourself. Another thing I was going to talk about is I think a lot more women should get back into vaginal steaming, into honoring the yoni, into honoring the vagina. Because, and not even just for black women, but even though I'm saying it's black women conference, okay, we need to be honoring our vaginas, okay? This is a life source, our womb areas, okay? And so my company got us detox. I know I had to bring in the queen's vaginal steam, okay? So we sell the queen's vaginal steam, but it's like, it's a vaginal steam at home. I have the seat, you have the herbs, you pray over the herbs, you put the hot water inside and you sit. You can either sit on top of the toilet area or you can get a, a closed room and you can have on a long skirt and you can squat. Now, what is that doing? The herbs, the medicinal properties of the herbs are going straight into your vagina. You've already prayed over it. And this is an indigenous practice that has been done in Latin cultures and African cultures and in Asian cultures. It's not nothing new. It's just coming up again as being something new, but it's not anything new. And some people ask, well, does something have to be wrong for my, with my vagina to do it? No. What is this doing? This is bringing awareness to yourself and to your vagina. And you're also having quiet time. So if you're the person that's like, well, I don't want to take an hour out a month to take a bath. Then you can sit for 20 minutes once a month on the vaginal steam and consult with yourself and connect with yourself. And a lot of women don't know that our vaginas are directly connected to our crown chakra. That's knowledge right here. And so what that vaginal steam is doing is clearing out the clutter, bringing some revitalized energy into your womb area and giving you direct connection to God, God as creator, whomever it is that you believe in. But we don't take the time. Again, you have to force it. But it's like these indigenous practices are coming back because back, 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 our ancestors did these practices and we need to take them on in a more modern way. And so for me, when it comes to black women and putting ourselves first, it's honestly taking the time. It's forcing the time. You have to remind yourself. I had to write in my journal the other day an affirmation for myself is the world will not crumble if I don't if I'm not the first one. The world will not crumble if I'm not the first one. Because a lot of times we're the first one to jump and do this, to jump and do that. But sometimes you can sit back. You can sit back and see what happens. The world's not gonna end. And when I say the world, I mean your world. Because sometimes we think if we're not doing it, it's just not gonna get done, you know? So I had to write affirmations for myself to, so that I could slow down. And I'm only gonna say with one thing, is that black women should really focus on putting their pleasures first. Black women should really focus on putting their pleasures first. Just like Andrew Media had mentioned, she talked about knowing what you want. Well, if you don't know what you want, right, start to get to know what you want. Like for me, during the day, if I'm not feeling it, because I do work from home, during the day, if I'm not feeling it, I watch my Chinese dramas and I watch my anime. And I listened to Kofa music the other day or some dance hall music and I wind in my waist, okay? So my thing is like, that's a simple pleasure. That's a simple joy. But I took the time for that. If you start adding in those pleasures into your life, you will see that your life can become more abundant because what you're saying is that I'm totally worth it. I'm going to take care of me. And what you're also projecting out into the universe is, wow, she believes that she's worth it. Wow, we just gotta, we gotta end some more blessings down on her because she took the time, because she puts herself first. That matters. It's not everyone else above you. It's you. 
So you have to force it. All right, that's my advice. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, seriously, everybody, for attending this panel. I know that I was moved by literally everything that Siobhan Olaniki and Andromeda has said. I hope that everybody was able to tune in and like, you know, just grasp everything that everybody was saying. And we have a few minutes for audience questions. So if there's any questions that anybody has for any of us on the panel, or even if there's just a testimony that anybody has about their experience with vaginal steaming or their experiences with self-love or anything like that, please feel free to use this opportunity to spread the love for everybody now. Any questions, comments, concerns, anything on your, what did my professor used to say? Hearts, minds, and souls. <laughs> Is this from, are and you I, going to be asking questions from that are going live right now? Because I see some questions that I can answer them now. Is that what you're asking? Yes, I know that there are a few questions coming in. Um, hmm. Olaniki, can you share the details to the basal bath again? Yes, hey court. This is cute. I like this. Okay, hey court. Um, so the basil bag. So you want to get fresh basil. Some people can do the dry basil, but I honestly, for this bath, I really prefer fresh basil. Spring water, not purified, not distilled. Spring bottled water. You're going to get the basil. You're going to put it in a bowl. You're going to pour the spring water into the bowl, and you're going to work the basil. That's what I call you. You're going to work the basil in your hands. You're going to say your own personal prayers that don't have to be religious. They can be affirmations about cleansing yourself, about releasing um, negative energy, about putting yourself in a higher vibration. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. The water is eventually going to turn green. You can keep the herbs in there or you can strain them. I like to wash myself with the herbs, so I keep the herbs in there. And then after your shower, because this doesn't have to be done in the bath, it's a spiritual wash. After your shower, you're going to get that water and the herbs and you're gonna rinse it over your body. And then the last thing you wanna do is pour the water over your head. Make sure it gets in your head, make sure it gets into your scalp and make sure it's cold. So you can even put this bath when you're done in the fridge for a little bit. And you're gonna be like, oh my God, it's cold, it's cold. But that's gonna be the best thing for yourself. And make sure to pray over it. And then when you're done, pat dry, and then wear white or light colored clothes to bed and don't interact with a lot of people after. The Chronicles of I Lotus says, how often should one Yoni steam? I did it for the first time last month and it changed my life. I think the Chronicles of I Lotus. Um, so I don't recommend doing it more than four times a month. And so you can do it up to four times a month, but it doesn't have to be that much. Um, so that's how often I would recommend it. If you want to just start off one time a month, cool. If you're a person that has really horrible menstrual cramps and you're trying to reduce those menstrual cramps, you could do it probably three days before your cycle and you want to probably do it two times or more a month. Yes, they help with fibroids. They help with fibroids. They help to shrink the fibroids as well as our goddess vaginal detox pearls from goddessdetox.org. <laughs> what are the benefits of vaginal steaming? So just fab, some of the benefits of vaginal steaming is one of the main things I want women to understand is what is the point of this? The point of vaginal steaming is to connect with yourself, connect with your yoni, as well as to get the medicinal properties of the herbs into your vagina, into your womb area. And so as those herbs are steaming, that steam is coming up, that steam has medicinal properties. So whatever herbs you are steaming with, you're taking those properties. So a lot of the herbs can reduce your pain and menstrual cramps. They can help reduce your fibroids. They can bring back natural lubrication to your vagina. So any woman that's dealing with dryness, I like to say it can help you detox your ex or any uh, sexual soul ties that you may have. Again, everything is energy. And so when you are having sex with somebody else, no matter who you're having sex with, you are exchanging energy. And so vaginal steaming can help to release that energy and no, vaginal steaming does not hurt. You want to have the water hot, but not super, super hot. That was so awkward. I had my mic on mute, so sorry. No as we transition out to the next session, I just want to thank literally each and every one of you ladies for offering your gems and expertise to 
over 600 people who are on this live stream. And before we go, everybody just say in one word, and we'll just go around in the same order that we did last time. What does mental health mean to you? So for me, mental health means, I, it's hyphenated, so I guess it's one word, check-in. Siobhan? Oh, I think you're muted. Mental health to me is really just being in balance and being, I'm sorry, being in tune with yourself. It's hard to put it into one word. <laughs> Olaniki? I'm gonna say love of self. That's multiple words. And Andromeda. <laughs> oh, on mute. Sorry. No. One more okay. time. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. Honoring me. Love that. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to the panelists. You guys have, you women have been absolutely incredible. Thank you for everybody who tuned into this session. And now we're going to have an incredible meditation session led by none other than Kelly Green. And now we have our beautiful birthday girl, Sharavine, <laughs> back in the flesh and in left. Hi, everyone. Wonderful. Oh, my God. That was such a powerful session. I was over here like, preach, okay? I'm a crowd. And sake of keeping up with time, we're going to turn it over to the one and only, as we like to say in our circle, the Kelly Green. The Kelly Green. Guide <laughs> us with this 10-minute guided meditation that she has curated specifically for us on today. So we're gonna pop Kelly on the stream and give her her time to shine. Hey ladies. Hi Kelly. <laughs> Congratulations on this. This is amazing. I'm so proud of both of you. Thank you're you so and you're looking fabulous birthday girl, as you know. <laughs> I try, I try. I'm gonna take us off and take it away, Kelly. Thank you, thank you both. Hi everyone, so excited to spend some time with you today and to just get grounded and get more connected with ourselves because beauty, of course, inside and out. And we wanna make sure we're connected with who we are throughout our entire lives because that's how we excel, that's, that's how we rise. So I know we have about 10 minutes here. So again, I'm excited to be here with all of you. I say, let's jump right in. So I'm gonna play a little music. So let's begin in a comfortable seated position. In a chair, feet planted firmly on the floor, or maybe sitting cross-legged. Find what's comfortable for you in this moment. And begin to allow your body to relax. Slowly close your eyes if you haven't already. And take a moment to tune into your breath. Let any tension you're holding in your body to relax. Relaxing your eyebrows, allowing your eyes to feel heavy, unclenching the tightness in your jaw, and simply allowing your face to rest. Notice any tension you may be holding elsewhere in your body. There might be tension in your neck and shoulders. So create space between your ears and your shoulders, elongating your spine and lifting the crown of your head towards the sky. Sit proudly, my dear. Take a deep breath. A deep, relaxing breath. Feel all that tension leaving your body as you settle into a place of self-reflection and healing. Take another deep breath and be aware that with every breath you take, you become more deeply relaxed and at ease. You feel yourself be becoming more at peace, moving deeper and deeper into a comfortable, safe place within yourself. Your mind and heart are becoming free from worry, free from fear. 
and you're feeling a warm, peaceful sensation growing within your chest. Now I want you to imagine yourself as a little girl. Imagine you, the adult, traveling back in time into your own memories. You are completely safe and in charge as you travel back into your own personal history to bring comfort, healing, peace, and reassurance to your younger self. Remember a time from your childhood when you needed comfort and love. It may be a time when you were deeply hurt and afraid or a time when you were alone and perhaps you felt like you had no one to turn to. As the adult you are today, travel back to that time and calmly, confidently, look for that child, that child that was you back then. And when you find that image of the child, approach her slowly, paying attention to the child. And just observe her for a few seconds looking at her, her hair, her eyes. Notice her position, her attitude, her expressions. Take it all in. This vision of, of your inner child, just take it all in. And as you look at this child, I want you to imagine a giant bubble on one side of her. It's a dark, scary, smoky bubble. And as you look closer at it, you recognize what's floating inside. There's pain, sadness, hurt, fear. That bubble is filled with dark memories and emotions. Looking at this, you might begin to feel the heaviness Sadness, disappointment, rejection, abandonment, fear. You see, this little girl created stories about each and every one of those memories or emotions. Maybe she created a story called, I'm, I'm not good enough, or I'm not worthy, I'm not loved, I can't trust anyone, I'm not beautiful. And now there's no shame for doing this. She created a narrative, just like many of us do. But you see, these stories that she created are not allowing you now to live as high of a, of a vibration as you would like. So take a deep, cleansing breath in. And as you exhale, honey, release the heaviness of all those stories. Let go of all the negative thoughts that you have been using to weigh you down. Let it go, release it. They are no longer welcome here. Now reach out to this little girl and embrace her in your arms, holding her close with love, pure love. And watch as that dark smoky bubble begins to shrink and dissolve. Hold her, hug her, love her, sit alongside her, embrace and accept her, and watch those stories evaporate away. Now take a step back again and observe this beautiful little child and imagine this big bright colored bubble on the other side of her this time. A bubble that is filled with laughter and confidence and goals and dreams and creativity and love. So much love and you can see these emotions within it just 
filling up that bubble with feelings of joy and excitement and lightheartedness. And as you witness all of this, also feel a smile spread across your face because what I just described is all yours. It's already yours. You are already incredible. You are loved. You are worthy. Do you see how happy this little girl is? Her smile is so bright. And she is here with you. You reach out and embrace her. And you feel her pure love just saturate you, just covering you completely, reminding you that you are her and she's you. You're worthy of everything you desire. You're deserving of the love you love to give. You are confident, intelligent, phenomenal. And know that you are always supported. Now bring your attention back to your breathing. Feeling that sensation of peace and calmness all over your body. From the beautiful crown of your head down to the tips of your toes. Feeling that high vibration of love that loving, powerful energy filling up your body. And all that positivity filling up your mind. Always remember how special you are. You can slowly bring your hands to your chest. Namaste, beautiful. Thank you so much for taking this time for yourself today and for spending the last 10 minutes with me. Always remember how phenomenal you are. Popping back in here, I just I just want to linger in this space that you yeah. created for us. Like it almost feels serene right now. Mm. Um Kelly, I can't thank you enough for <laughs> lending your expertise to this moment, um, for creating this space for us, um, especially for me, because, you know, uh, just running the back end and the yeah. front end of it at the same time, I don't think you understand. Major, <laughs> no, <this is> major. <laughs> How <laughs> much um, I needed that moment in the midst of all yeah. that is like yeah. on here. So we do appreciate you. And if there's anyone in the comment section that has a question or anything to say to Kelly, please let me know. They are loving on you in this comment section, oh, really? Kelly. Oh, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> mm -hmm. right, let me see. I wasn't looking at the comments, but oh, this y'all are so sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all are awesome. Oh my gosh, so emotional in a great way. Yeah, good. I just wanted you to connect with yourself. Oh, this is love. Oh, I love this. <laughs> we just want to share our thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our appreciation for the space that you have created for us within this conference. Yeah. Once again, um, please do go follow Kelly. Yes, please. See Kelly Green. Because I answer, I answer DMs, comments. I'm I'm here for y'all. Y'all are always supported. Oh, someone asked how often should we meditate? Every day, at least once a day. Um, personally, I do that in the morning, first thing when I wake up, and um, yeah, it makes a world of difference energetically and spiritually. Just everything. I'm more focused. I'm more clear on things, and yeah, 
every day, at least once a day. <laughs> we have one more question. I just saw. Oh, sure. I know we have to stay on time, but yeah. But a powerful meditation oh, no, session. No, that was long. Okay. Sorry, Good. there goes the question. <laughs> How do you teach yourself to ignore surroundings, distractions during meditation? It comes with practice. Um, a big thing that will help you all is connecting back to your breath. So we have about 50 to 80,000 thoughts per day. So it's common that when you're trying to center yourself and meditate that the thoughts swimming around in your mind are going to be loud and or you may be distracted by loud noises and things like that. But once you recognize that and you're very aware to what those sounds are, you focus back on your breath. So even if you start counting, inhaling one, exhaling two, like in your mind, then you connect back to that and you'll learn to avoid those distractions. Great question. <laughs> and if you have any other questions, I know we, we um, are timed on this, you can just feel free to DM me and I'll, I'll respond. One last display of love for you <laughs> on your way out. And something I totally agree with, um, you guys. Oh, that's a really good point, yeah. A certified yoga instructor. And this is why, because- I've been doing yeah. it. Yes, I wanted to bring this to, to our people because I even stereotyped it like, oh, yoga and meditation is boring, it's dull. Like I have a dancing background. I was like, I'm not with this. But then when I took a class, I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, I need this. Okay, and now I need to bring this to all of y'all. So that's, that, that's what the goal was. This is awesome. I should have recorded this whole love potion. <laughs> Don't worry because the link that everyone's watching this on on YouTube will automatically save as a full video on my YouTube channel. So you can turn right. back to this link and watch this whole conference at any love time. It. Kelly, we You're love right. you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Instagram um, is on my, hope you guys yeah, it's right there. asking for it. Yeah, it's in the at Kelly yeah. Green underscore. Yeah, K-E-L-L-E-Y, green like the color, underscore. Thank you, Kelly. Right. You're welcome. Enjoy Love you. everyone. Love you, Shaq. Bye. All righty, guys, we're going to move into the next session. I'm going to bring on to the screen Blake, Kalia, and Darian. Hello, ladies. Hey. So excited to speak with you. Um, just want to jump right into it and have each one of you introduce yourself, starting with Blake. Uh, so, hey guys, I'm Blake Newby and I am a freelance beauty writer and living in New York City. Kalia? Hi, I'm Kalia Underwood and I'm beauty editor at the Zola Report and I'm based in New York City as well. Darian. Hi, I'm Darian. I'm a beauty reporter. I focus on um, beauty at the intersection of like politics and pop culture. That's like what I like to focus on. Yeah. Awesome. So I know I didn't mention this, mention this in the beginning, but this is our second beauty panel entitled Women of Color in Beauty, Consume, Create, Cultivate. So we're going to just talk about um, the space that we take up in the beauty industry. And to start off the conversation, I know personally um, within like my close circle and my family, beauty processes and going to the hair salon and sitting between your mother's legs and things like that started very young. So let's just talk about, you know, like maybe your earliest or fondest memories of like things like beauty processes or trying beauty products, you know, putting on your mom's makeup or whatever it may be. Yeah, I, um, my, growing up, my mom was actually, she, my mom was a hairstylist and she went from doing hair within a salon to eventually like turning our, um, a space in our home into, um, into like a mini salon just for her and her clients. And so I grew up like, you, you know how sometimes you go to college and it's like, you are either like the black girl who you're trying to figure out like, where or who or how you're going to get your hair done or you're like the black girl who's like doing all the black girl's hair or if you go to a PWI like I did there there were not many many of us then I, I felt like I was like the black girl who was like helping girls to figure out like what to do with their hair and so I definitely always like a bonding moment and something that even today like as I circle back I haven't always been focused on um, beauty writing um I look back and I go, this has been a part of my life for so long. And now it, I'm feeling like I'm having this full circle moment. 
Yeah, same. Beauty is something that I've always been surrounded by. My grandmother was a licensed hairdresser, and I always remember just being excited when she pulled out the hooded bonnet and rollers, and I would watch her do my mom and my aunt's hair. Um, and even my dad, like, I would always just watch him, and um, he had this really extensive skincare routine with, like, oil of Olay and all these different products. So that's on a surface level, but also it's just something that I've always been drawn to. Like, I think that beauty is one of the most intimate forms of art, you know, whether it be like the ritualistic um, aspects of skincare or painting on your face with eyeshadow palettes. Like, I think that it's beautiful and it's ever evolving and it's never boring. I think my my mom was, well, she wasn't a hairstylist. She was very much the kitchen beautician mom. Um, I think kind of, you know, um, passed down to me. And it was just like that was how, you know, I fell in love with beauty and kind of echoing Darian sentiments. I went to Howard and I was the girl that, at Howard, they knew me as Beat by Blake. I was doing full faces for $15. I was trimming hair for 10 Like, that was the the girl that I was. And so I think that it just kind of, it's full circle now that, um, you know, that's my profession and what I do for a living is beauty. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, speaking to something that, Dar that Darian said, I actually like struggled so much in college that I was like, I'm just gonna go natural. Like, I don't know these salons in Atlanta cause I'm from New York as well. I went to school in Atlanta and I was like, I don't know these salons. Um, I wasn't really like into the braids or the weaves and things like that. So I was like, I'm just gonna just go natural and wing it. And it's just something that stuck with me since then. Um, but to move forward, I feel like in our community as black women and just as black people in general, we often refer to things as like being a part of the culture. Like, it's just like, you know, oh, that's a part of the culture. Like that's just the culture. How do you all define the culture and does your definition of the culture show up in the beauty in the beauty articles that you write or the beauty content in general that you create? I actually love this question because we I feel like we don't ask each other to define what the culture means to us. And I feel like defining that for yourself um, can help you actually to understand your career and what you want to do. For me, culture is what people make, create, do, and say based off of um, events or things that are happening around us. Um, what people do, what they create, how they act um, around the, re the results of the election. What people, um, what kind of things that, what kind of groups that people form, uh, um, how do people react to the launch of Fenty and Fifty Shades? You know, like for me, it's actually about how we respond as people that is culture versus like what brands do. Like for me, it's how we respond to brands and what they and what they do and, and how and what kind of great um, conversations that we start. For me, that's what I think culture is. And so when I'm thinking about my work, a lot of my a lot of my work and what I decide to write about has to do with conversations I see happening. Um, or they have to do with, for me, like black stories that um, are hiding in plain sight. Like, for example, um, or Blake, you talking about Howard and, um, you know, how you were you were like a dorm room beautician, essentially. I felt I wrote about Essentially, I wrote for Refinery29 Unbothered. I wrote a story about um, how Black college students were making money uh, by doing hair or being barbers in schools as a way to pay for their tuition and um, or for any other living expenses, you know, while maybe they did not have support, maybe they needed a job and this is what they picked up. To me, that is culture. Like, it is, it is it is the act of doing something around your economic situation, right? And so um, I wrote a story about that because I realized that it was something that was happening so commonly and that everyone knew about, but no one had given it like that stamp of like, not no one, but I just wanted to kind of write something new on it. I wanted to talk to as many students as I could and really put the reporting behind it so that people understood that this was like, this was not a taboo thing. This is a very, very common practice amongst Black students. And so, 
yeah, that's how I de- that's how I define culture. Also, you guys go read that article because that article was <laughs> phenomenal. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, Darian touched on many of um, my points. Like, I think that the culture is anything that serves Black women, nourishes Black women, and, you know, serves as a talking point, as a drawing board, anything of that sort. And more specifically, the way that I think that I try to make sure it shows up is really visibly, like, writing for the web, it's always about words. Blake knows this because we work together. It's just as much about words as it is about the imagery so even if it's something as simple as like a roundup of drugstore nail polishes i'm always making that making sure that there's like a brown or black hand reflected in it because i know that just like that cursory scroll it could stay with you forever you know much like me and the images and the stories that i took in like i grew up with essence and jet in my household. Like I would always steal my grandparents' magazines. They had a huge stack and it made me feel important. It made me feel seen compared to like the other teen magazines that I read. So I always just want to make sure that people feel seen no matter what it is. And yeah, the culture, we, we are the culture, like nothing moves without us. Um, and so I think like, as Kalia said, we work together and it is important just in, just in the, the words that we use in the, just thinking about the small things, like so that, as Kalia said, so that black women can see themselves. I think that there are so many things that we just, um, that people just think, oh, like a a general beauty story is, oh, okay, well, if it's just lipsticks. Okay, no, it's not just lipsticks. Um, The way that our skin responds to certain undertones is completely different. There are so many things um, that, we have to consider when creating content for us. That actually perfectly segues uh, into my next question, which is as black women who are both simultaneously in the beauty industry, but on the editorial side, mostly and mainly, what are some issues or concerns of yours regarding the industry and you know the way that you have to maneuver in it as a black woman? I think for me, I get probably a minimum of 30 pitches a day. And there's such a conversation about inclusion. Whatever I consider, I just want to make sure that it's genuine. Like, you know, the Fenty effect, I know we're going to talk about that later, but the Fenty effect just had a tailspin on the industry. And it's one that I'm grateful for. And I'm grateful to be an editor in this era. But I also just want to make sure that, like, if you're pitching me, a foundation shade range with like 40, 50 shades, it's not just because you want, you know, brown and black dollars. Like I wanna make sure that you actually had black people, brown people, people of color, you know, working on your team, testing it truly. That's a question that I always have at best size and meetings and events, like was this tested on people of color, especially with hair as well. So I think that a genuine effort is something that is super duper important in this day and age. And I think Kalia touched on something that is the most important. Just have black women on your team. There are so many of these flubs that would be prevented and so many of these, these you know, big scandals that would just be prevented, not only if you had black women, but if you had black women that you all were willing to listen to. Not black women who you keep at the lowest assistant level just so that you can say that you have a black woman on the team, but a black woman whose suggestions Um, you are willing to consider and that you have created a space where she feels comfortable enough to speak up when something is wrong or to speak up when you are saying, you know, when things are just not right. Um, So it's more than just having us there. It's giving us the safe space to feel like we can speak up and actually um, effectively advocate for other black women. Yeah, I would say a lot of what has kept me going, even through some of the things that, you know, I don't, I don't always love about even like beauty or the media landscape is just like finding your people, right? Finding the people who understand your vision, you understand theirs, and you are there to support each other no matter what. And also I feel that, and also like functioning, making sure that you're not functioning from from a place of scarcity. I think is really important too, even just as as black women, for us to continue to just do our thing, period. 
you know, not in response to um, in response to a horrible like marketing flub or, or like things of that nature. But just like we create dope stuff separate from whatever these people have going on. And I'm just going to continue to be great at what I do. And um, I'm in a place where I'm willing to share my knowledge with other writers, other editors, and we're not competing, but we're all working together because we have a common goal. Absolutely. I think you all just mentioned some really powerful and really important um, key points when it comes to building a team, um, because the boardroom really reflects what the build the billboard looks like, you know? Um, and when you don't have that diversity in the boardroom, it clearly shows in your ad campaigns. It clearly shows in your boardrooms. It clearly shows when we walk into Sephora and we're not there, you know, like we're, we're trying to test the new foundations for XYZ brand. And it's just like, I don't see me here. And it's like kind of awkward because you're trying to go to the, you know, the person who's working there and you're like, um, it's just like as full as the range goes. And they're like, yeah, they, you know, maneuvering into this little section over here where there's like maybe a couple of other brands who have a warmer couple of shades in um, their their roster. Um, but just to go backwards a little bit and zero in on something that um, Blake and Kalia had mentioned specifically, but if we could, and you know, there's a host of people watching right now, what does it look like to correctly execute a diverse and inclusive campaign? I think that the gut check is really important. Like just making sure that you sound like you and you're not trying to market to what you think people want to hear. Like I hate the pitches that have like, hey sis and hot girl summer like that type of language, like that's not gonna make me wanna test your product and that's not gonna make anyone that I would know want to buy your product. So I think just sounding genuine, you know, doing your research, we have to do it as editors and writers, so you should be doing it on the marketing side of things as well. Um, and also something that I find lacking is body diversity as well. Like you might see dark skin models these days, which is great, but it's really hard even for stock imagery to find, you know, a curvy woman or a plus woman, you know, or a trans woman as well. Um, so I think that just being conscious before you, you know, add like a dark skin model or like a medium tone model and, you know, you think that you've done a great thing, like just be more reflexive. And don't do it if you don't care. Like, I think that's the easiest way. I know that that's, of course, especially for brands, easier said than done. But one thing that Jackie Anna said a while ago that was so true is that every brand does not need to have 50 foundation shades. And that's okay. Like, inclusivity is not for every brand, and that is okay. It because Inclusivity is so trendy, right? But to us, it's, it's our real life. And so if you are creating... Like there's there's some K beauty brands that I can appreciate. They have their ten foundation shades, and they are all on the lighter end. And you ask them if they're creating darker shades, and the answer is no. And that's okay. We're not their demographic. They're not doing the. They're not you know faking the funk for us. And so I think that it's important for brands to think about like what is actually important to us. Yeah. And if you will always have your niche group of women who are gonna buy from you and just keep it there. It's, you know, it's, yeah. I, I agree with, with everything Blake really just said, like, it would save me so much time, you know, like just fake, like faking the funk and, and really being honest about like who your demo is or even within us as black women, understanding, right, the whole, like we're not a monolith we all have different things that we're interested in. And just because we're all black women doesn't mean that we all love the same five things. Yeah. And I think that is actually very important to, in, to inclusivity too, when we're thinking and, and understanding that like race does not equate to all of the same um, uh, similarities in or, or interests or tastes, you know? Absolutely. And Kalia touched on this earlier, but we're gonna jump into the like 
craze and the magnitude of what Rihanna did when she launched Fenty Beauty and literally just showed the, I don't really, honestly, I feel like the world knew, but they didn't really understand until our community came out and came strong behind Rihanna when she came out with um, all of the shades that she has for her foundation. So I know what it looks like as a consumer, but I'm curious to know what it looks like on the editorial and the back end of that. So when when Rihanna launched uh, Fenty Beauty and it took the world by storm and everybody was talking about it, did you see um, a shift in the pitches that you're getting and the way that brands are now like reaching out to you and wanting to start those conversations with you? What was like? What was that like on the editorial end? The pitches became Fifty Shades. Like the pitch headlines just started. Like now every pitch shade is like. 50 diverse shades, 60 concealer colors. Nobody needs 60 concealer colors. Like, I want to make that clear. Nobody needs 60 concealer colors. But now just the pitches, like all the pitches that you get, like eyeshadow for every skin tone. This red lip works for every skin. Like, it's just now, it's just like every pitch, especially makeup, is there. there's the diversity aspect that is somewhere within the pitch. Um, that's what I see. And it's exhausting because, you know, there's brands who did it afterwards. I won't say any specific names, but there was one brand in particular that decided to do a large foundation line and black influencers were swatching them and they were all gray. All of them were gray and awful. And that happens all the time. That's not, you know, so I think it just became a lot more, you know, disingenuous um, pitching and stuff like that. And I think we love Fenty so much because the effort feels genuine. Like we know that Rihanna was sneakily testing the products and wearing the products without us even knowing it. You know, it's something that actually came from a true place because I think that every girl of color has had the experience where she's had to mix and match foundations and concealers and, you know, use a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Fenty had these core 40 shades that actually worked you know, and it made you feel seen. You actually felt like you could go into Sephora or any, you know, high-end department store, go to the counter and leave versus, you know, leave in tears. I've had so many times personally where I went to the beauty store and I just, I couldn't find anything. Like in college, I was walking around with this, just the wrong shade of everything because I truly didn't know. And so I think that it was really a reset for that. And not to even dismiss like, other brands that did have us in mind, like the fashion fairs of the world and whatnot. But I also think that Fenty Beauty appealed to so many of us because of the look as well. Like mm. I keep on talking about like cheesy marketing, but sadly it's a thing. Like, you know, you have these products that have like a lot of like golds and reds and greens and like they want it to like they want the black consumer to know like this is for African American people. You know, Fenty, it's just super clean, like the glass bottles, the white tops, you know, it makes you feel cool wearing it. And it also makes you feel like good on the inside as well. Um, I always feel like there's like pre-Fenty and then like post-Fenty. I feel like when we look back in history, we're gonna be able to like be in documentaries and like talk, that's like how a producer is gonna be able to like separate the segments. Um, but I feel like for me now that something that should have been done so long ago was was done. I think granted there were there were definitely brands like Mac or Bobby Brown that had that had more shades, but I think what distinguished Fenty was the fact that it was a Fenty is a it's not a it's not a luxury makeup brand, but it's um it's definitely like it's it's in the realm of the of the Macs or the Bobby Browns of the world, and I think it's very important to see a brand a new brand like that within that space that is um, that serves uh, women of color um, and especially Black women because we hold so much buying global buying power within the beauty industry, and I feel like now I'm very eager for like okay what's next like what like what is the next conversation like what is the next thing we need to we need to tackle with M beauty. Um, and I'm very excited for that and whatever that that looks like. Absolutely. Um, and you just touched on something that's really important and should go mentioned, which is that women of color are by large and by far the biggest beauty consumers there are. And it's kind of insane to me to think that like 
because our 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 buying power is so large and so powerful that we're almost always excluded from the conversation. It it just blows my mind. Um, and I think we touched on this a little bit um, before, but just to reiterate again, like because of the fact that our buying power is is so high and so large, where do you think the disconnect comes from on the brand and retail side? Or wait, where does the connect you said? The disconnect. Oh, the disconnect. I just don't think that we were thought of for a while, frankly. Um, you know, like Blake said, like people don't hire enough black women and women of color. So if there's no one that looks like you at the drawing board at these pitch meetings, you're not going to be thought of. You know, even far back, like this sort of applies on the editorial side. I um, I interned at a major magazine during college, and like there was an intern pitch meeting, and they were asking like, who would you want to see on the color cover? Mm-hmm. Everyone was saying these different white actresses and musicians, which is all well and wonderful, but literally no one thought of black women not one black name was listed. I was the only one to list black people. And, you know, I don't know if that made a major difference. I was just an intern, but I think that that's reflective of what goes on in these meetings. Like there's no representation. If you don't have representation on the back end, it's not gonna be reflected on the front end of things. Absolutely. And I think that's just a message, a message, excuse me, to everyone who's watching that your opinion matters. Like when you're in these rooms, your opinion matters, especially just quite frankly speaking, as as a young black woman in corporate. At first, I was like I was in these rooms and I was like, yeah, no one looks like me. Like, is anyone going to listen to me? But I really had to snap out of that and realize that I was in that room for a reason. And it really doesn't even matter if you're sitting at the at the, um, the conference table or if you're sitting in a chair away from the conference table, you're in that room for a reason and your voice means something especially if it can help combat what we see as consumers on the other side of things um which brings me into my last topic and i'll skate around names but hopefully we can pick up on what i'm talking about um there was a a while back there was a department store that put out an ad um that had i believe it was a young black boy in a t-shirt that had a monkey on it and I don't remember what the language on the shirt was, but obviously it was very offensive and it wasn't thought through. And recently a mega reality star and um, social media influencer put out a face mask launch and uh, the face mask were supposed to be nude. And she had a black model that had on a black face mask and that Branding basically said that um, the color black is women of colors nude. Um, How do we, as consumers, navigate those ads, those brands, those conversations, and, you know, try to take our anger away from it and really step forward to help these brands realize that like there's so much more work that you need to do um especially when it comes to fully including us in the conversation i think we need to take back buying power like and actually do it because the reality is the brand that you mentioned that did the black face mask people every day though are still people that look like us every day are still buying from that brand yes the stuff is very cute right like i've looked at it too like Oh, that'd be so cute to lounge around the house in. But the reality is I am putting money in the pockets of someone who has the resources to know what is right and wrong and continues to do the contrary all the time because she knows people that look like us will continue to support her because the other clothes are cute and because everything else. And so at some point we are going to have to actually decide and make the conscious decision to not buy from these brands. Yeah. That like that's and and it's yes, like I said, it's easier said than done. But what other way? She continues to do things over and over again because she knows that nobody is going to stop buying from her. Nobody, and and they haven't. So, anyone else? Yeah, retweet on everything that Blake just said. Like, buy black. Honestly, like the biggest point 
that we could make is to take whatever we're going to spend on brands like the brand that won't be named and support a brand that's probably been doing, you know, whatever she's doing long before she even thought of it, you know, especially with makeup and skincare. Like there are plenty of minority owned brands that we can support. And sadly, they don't necessarily have the same visibility as what you see in the department store or on your feed. But I think that it just takes a little bit of research and just that consciousness to, you know, pour your money into the brands that actually deserve it. I would just add one thing is I feel like I have been definitely reassessing my buying habits during this time, especially now that I have more time to sit back and really think about them. I would do the same with makeup and hair. You know, I'm never going to buy groceries the same way that I was buying groceries before. I'm never going to buy books the way that I that I that I was in the past on Amazon, even. you know, so use this use this time to rethink. Um, or to, you know, try some, you know, maybe you were using one product by someone whose politics you don't agree with. Use this time to maybe research something else. Use this time to reassess your, your, your buying habits, basically. I'm going to open it up for audience questions. And while those flow in, if each of you could say something to the young Black women or the Black women in general that are watching this, um, and are trying to figure out, you know, how to create their own lane, maybe specifically in beauty, right? Like, how do I show up? What, you know, what steps can I take to start putting my name out there and, you know, create the change that I want to see in this industry? I would say, uh, for me, a lot of reading and a lot of research, even on stuff that is not even related to beauty. So many of my ideas or so much of my inspiration that I pull from my own work actually is like not always within beauty. Like sometimes it's me talking to my grandma, it's me having conversations, it's being observant when I am out. Um, sometimes I think that we, we think we get so focused on figuring out what the thing is that we're not paying attention to life around us. And so reading music, exploring other interests that will literally like open up your mind so that you can understand what what you want to do it will help it'll help you to, to to figure that out um that's been so that's been so helpful to me and then obviously do research about the field that you want to be in google stuff like beauty what's the beauty industry like or state of the beauty industry you know use market research outlets to or firms to look at their assessments even right now for WWD or Business of Fashion or Glossy that talk about sales and what, what's thriving, what's not within beauty right now and why. Um, I, I just feel like doing those sorts of things. There's so many ways to be involved within media. There's so many ways to be involved within beauty. Allow yourself to go on that journey of, of figuring that out. And reach out to other black women. Like you'd be, you, like there's so many women willing to help. Like Kalia being one, who was for me, like there are so many women who are just willing to help, like who just have resources and just, it, even if they don't know exactly, they can, maybe can point you in the direction of somebody who knows how to get you where you're going. It's important just to ask, put yourself out there, ask people, well, we can't do ask people to coffees now, but ask people on Zoom calls, ask to just pick their brain. Like there are so many black women in positions like myself, Kalia and Darian, who are willing to help who have resources that can help you. And so it's important to, to network across and network up, so yeah. And I just say, you know, bang down the door until it opens. Like I meet so many people who feel discouraged or who said like, oh, I'd love to be doing what you're doing, but I just could never X, Y, Z. Like know that you have a place and a seat at the table and that your voice matters and that your opinions matter and that they're valid and that they're important and that that one idea could change the course of an entire campaign and that campaign can be see, seen by you know a young girl who carries that positive imagery with her for the rest of her, your life you know don't give up until your point is made mm -hmm. so we have one question um, I make it a habit to make a budget each each month to support black owned businesses. It has helped with intentional purchase. What do you guys think about conscious buying? 
That's a really good, I feel like I need to start doing that, honestly, just putting aside some budget in, so I can be intentional in that way. So thank you for that tip flex and fly. But um, yeah, I would say, again, like reassessing your, your buying power now. I think if you are feeling like it's something that you're not doing or could be better at, use this time in order to do so. Um, 100% here for conscious buying because even though we may not see or feel the effects of it, the collective pursuit of it, the people who need to know and understand the marketers, the brand strategists, they're paying attention. Awesome. We have one last one. Besides Fenty Beauty, what other beauty brands are doing a great job of creating and marketing products for people of color? Pat McGrath Labs. I will never yeah. not stand mother. Like I am obsessed with anything that she puts out. Like it's tried, it's tested, it's true, and it's genuine. And I stand forever. <laughs> and Lancome has been doing it for years. Before Fenty, before Lancome has been thinking of women of color. And I think that they're often left out of conversations. They've had problematic you know, situations before, but they are constantly um, creating shade ranges and things like that for women of color in Austin. I love um, Oma, I, I think it's pronounced Oma Beauty. It's U-O-M-A. I just love their line. To me, honestly, if I'm being honest, in terms of packaging um, and branding, it's like up there with like, like Fenty, in, in my opinion, in terms of just like how it like, it's just the, the branding of it is really clean. It's very expressive. It um, The quality is there. It's founded by a Nigerian American woman. Um, oh, this is like, I, just, I have on the lip gloss right now. I just love their products. And I feel like whenever I use something by them, I don't have to worry about looking crazy. You know, like, I know I'm not gonna look crazy. So shout out to Alma. <laughs> well, thank you ladies so much um, for joining me today for this amazing conversation. I wish I could show you all the comments, but you, when you hop off, you can definitely stay if you would like and chat with everyone in the comment section. They are loving your energy and loving your answers. Um, I'm gonna pop you guys off the screen and we're gonna move into the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Well, first and foremost, Shaw, you did an incredible job facilitating that conversation. I think it was <laughs> not about. I think it was very much so needed, especially from the consumer end. I've never written about beauty. I'm not really a beauty girl, but knowing how much my dollar is worth in the beauty industry as a black woman, I think it was absolutely necessary. And moving right along to the next panel, the next wellness panel, I'm super excited and I hope that you guys can all stay. And thank you for those of y'all who, who've been rocking with us since noon. Um, next, we're gonna have the Your Body and You Mental Wellness, Nutrition and Physical Wellness panel. So it's a panel that talks insanely heavy on the correlation between your mental health, what you put in your body, and exercise. And I know that a lot of people sometimes have all these conversations separately, but we really need to mend the bridges and talk about how all of those work in one. So I would like to formally introduce Yasmin Jamila, Amber Gordon, and Denise Liv. Hi, ladies. Hi. So I'm going to pop off now, and I hope that everybody enjoys this incredible conversation about mental health, physical wellness, and nutrition. And I will see all of y'all soon. Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Denise Liv. Welcome to this mental health, nutrition, and physical wellness panel. Um, so just so that we can all get acquainted and learn more about each other before we dive into these much needed conversations. Again, my name is Denise Liv. I am the founder and CEO of the Self Love Organization. The Self Love Organization is an online wellness community resource and club for women of color, bridging the gap between mental health and self love through the acts of therapy, sisterhood, and community. So a little bit about me. Let's learn about the other ladies here with us today. So Yasmin, can you share a little bit more about yourself? Hello, everyone. So my name is Yasmin Jamila, and I am the CEO and founder of Transparent and Black. And so we are a wellness collective where the healing of Black people is the priority. And so for us, 
that looks like just owning every part of who we are, embracing multiple aspects of wellness as well, because I feel like so many people, you know, we look at wellness as one thing. Some people look at wellness as terms of fitness or some people look at wellness in terms of meditation. And so we like to bridge the gap and look at wellness as being as multifaceted as black people, but it just also being an experience of our everyday lives. Awesome, awesome, Amber. Hi, my name is Amber and I am the founder of Amber Got the Juice. I am your homegirl. Also, I am your holistic nutritionist and certified health coach. Um, I gear towards people who um, deal with chronic illnesses. So I try to break generational curses of chronic illnesses. And the reason why I got into that passion is because I healed myself from autoimmune diseases. So I've dealt with clients who battle with diabetes, high blood pressure, leukemia, picos, fibroids, um, the list goes on and on. So um, my 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 target is for people to live a healthier lifestyle and know that you can heal your chronic illness holistically. Awesome. Well, thank you, ladies, of course. And I'm happy that we're all here to have this amazing and much needed conversation. And thanks everyone who is here watching us um, through this live stream. Welcome to this panel. You guys can, of course, leave your questions in the comments. We'll be getting to that soon. But let's just jump into some of these much needed conversations. And the first question that I have uh, that I would like to bring to the table is how does your mental health and physical health work together? How do they intertwine? What are your thoughts on that, ladies? I can start. Well, I know if your mental health is out of whack, it affects your physical health. And your physical health, if it's out of whack, it messes with your mental health. And I can take and I can attest to that when I was going through my um, autoimmune disease, I was my mental health was all over the place. I was depressed, anxiety. I was questioning why me. I wasn't happy. I was putting on like a fake smile. And um, I just felt my confidence was very low. Also, I feel like once you're in that mental state, you can physically make yourself sick. I know of people who will say, um, I'm sick, I'm tired or I'm stressed. And you're feeding that into your body. And when that happens, you can physically make yourself catch the cold, the flu. So you got to be very cautious of what you pour into yourself, what you think. And when you are in that space, I know when I was in that space of having my chronic illness, I start speaking affirmations into myself. I was saying, I am healed. I am strong. I am sexy. I am beautiful. I can move because I couldn't even like my, it was so bad. I couldn't move. I can move. I can stretch. I can run. I am healthy. So you got to be careful with what you pour into yourself because it can really affect your physical. Thank you. Awesome. What about you, Yasmin? So I like to think that everything works together. So for me personally, um, in tandem with my my wellness company, I'm also have been like on a personal wellness journey. So I, when I was in college, I gained about a hundred pounds due to weight gain, anxiety, depression, and so I'm now at the point where I've lost over half of that weight naturally. And so for me, what that process has looked like has just been um, just really like getting to the root of those issues. And the root of that was for me was trauma. And so I think that for so many like people, we, we don't we don't really see the connection to that. And so when I realized that like trauma was the reason why I was eating poorly. Trauma was the reason why I was avoiding therapy. Trauma was the reason why I wasn't, you know, like embracing the fact that for me, what grounds me before any of those things is spirituality and religion. And so just also holding space for all of those things. And I think that like, especially within the wellness community, like that we can, you know, like grab hold to one thing really strong. We'll grab hold to, you know, like healthy eating, but we'll have horrible relationships because we haven't assessed certain things mentally. We'll, you know, grab hold to therapy, but we'll feel like we don't need to work out or we'll get to that when we need to, you know? And so for me, it's just been important to like make wellness, like a part of my life in every aspect and to like look at healing is not this one dimensional thing, but to ask myself, like, if, if I'm going to heal my physical body, then I'm going to feel I heal myself mentally. I'm going to heal myself emotionally, financially, spiritually, and just making it something that's an experience. And, and so as a result, you'll create a life that you don't need to have an escape from, because that was the case for me for, for a really long time. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it is, it, it's really important, especially as it relates to mental health, because, you know, for so many of us, I feel like it would be like, so horrible to not 
you know, say that because like for black people, we're told we don't need therapy. We don't need to talk to people about our mental health. And like, all you need is church. And I love church. I'm a Christian. And you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm a proud, you know, Christian, but for me, I feel like it's important to know that you really can do both. Like you really can pray and go to therapy. Like I, and I feel like you actually should, like I, the, the best days that I have are when I wake up and I spend time with God before I do anything else. And then after that, I work out and I, you know, assess myself mentally. I, you know, I meditate. And so like, for me, there is no one without the other. And I feel like they all should work together in whatever way wellness looks like for you. I feel like wellness is a really personal word and I like to break words down. And I, I think that like, when I visualize it, I think that wellness is you seeking to be well. And so whatever that looks like for you, you need to make sure that you're doing that on a daily basis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. I And to piggyback off of what you just said, I 100% see wellness as a holistic approach to the betterment of your health, of your finances, of your community, because wellness is also something that could be community driven as well. So the way I see wellness when it comes down to mental health and physical health, they have to go together. And they also play like, like a cause and effect on each other as well. So if you're not feeling good mentally, it's going to affect the way you look and feel physically as right. you shared and vice versa. And mm -hmm. it also kind of plays a mind, a, kind of like a mind trick as well, because when you are enriched with body positivity, and when you are enriched and feeling that you are the hottest, flyest, savage out there, you can have the biggest gut, the hugest thighs, the, the X, Y, and Z, insert insecurities here and still feel amazing. And, and I personally have learned this on my self-love diet, which is something that I teach at the self-love org, where um, kind of removing the idea of diet and kind of moving it into the idea of, um, of like more of like a routine something that you do consistently so that you can actually see results. So I personally was, I'm five feet. I'm a really small person, <laughs> but um, due to not being in a good um, mental space, although I was a physical person and liked to do yoga and liked to, liked to work out, I was gaining weight so fast. And I went from being like 120 pounds, which is pretty average for my five feet body to 150. So that was such a big jump for me. And mentally I had to readjust the fact that my body will never be 120 for all its life. And even that is a mental challenge and like a mental workout that like you have to do as well. But using the self-love diet, learning more about just accepting my body for what it is and what it could do. Like it can still run, it can still jump, it can still cook, it can still dance, it can still whine, it can do everything that it could have done at 120. It's just a little thicker now, you know, like changing your perspective. Um, and that's all a mind trick again. So I'm still 150, but I'm loving it. <laughs> and it really does go hand in hand. The two cannot coexist like without the other. So thank you for sharing your thoughts on that, ladies. So we have we have another question that I would like to bring to the table as well, which is what do you do to maintain good physical health? I know that we just spoke about how physical health and mental health kind of goes together, but what are your best practices for physical health? Because as you shared, um, Yasmin, that could mean different things for different people. Some people may like to um, do dance workouts and some people may just like to do yoga or some people like to kind of mix them together and kind of make something that's for them. So I would love to hear from you ladies um, being experts in your field about what you think about, like how do you um, maintain and like what is a good uh, physical healthy Well, I think that before you even get started with your routine, you need to have honest conversations with yourself. And so for me, like in terms of like getting into a good physical routine, for a long time, I equated like fitness with weight loss and fat shaming. And so for me, I had to understand that like, no, everybody needs to eat healthy. Everyone needs to work out. Like this is something that like not as exclusive to people who are desiring to lose weight, but that it's important to like get your body moving and how physical activity releases endorphins. And so like, and, and what those benefits are. And so for me, it was adjusting to that because I think that for so long, as children, especially people that have struggled with their weight, they're always being told to like, you don't need to eat this, you don't need to eat that. And so when we get older, we feel like, well, no, I'm gonna eat everything I couldn't eat before because I'm grown. But what that also does is not allow for you to develop you know, healthy eating habits. And so once I had those conversations with myself, um, I got to a place where I said, okay, like, let's discover what workouts we like. So I love to run. And sometimes when running is difficult, I walk really fast or I lightly jog. I love yoga. I love swimming. Uh, there's like several things that are really important to me. Swimming more than anything, it's become one of my favorite workouts that in tandem with running. And then in terms of my food consumption, 
it's just been really important to me to realize what it is that works with my body and what doesn't. I know Amber had briefly spoke about Picos and I had had a, um, I naturally healed myself from Picos. And so for me, that looked like me changing my diet. And so I switched to like all low carb fruits and vegetables um, outside of coffee once a day with agave and coconut oil. I don't have anything else other than water and green juice with no fruits in it, which is a whole other conversation about how we put too much fruits in smoothies. But we'll get, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, just like just really getting adamant about like understanding what my body needs versus what I want and me teaching my body like, no, this is how we're going to eat now and not making it a thing where I don't enjoy my food, but making it something where like I get excited to eat salads. I get excited to make my own dressings and just really create a life for myself as far as what I'm eating that I can enjoy. And so it's not a, a place where I'm like, oh. I'm about to eat this salad. It's like, well, like, let me tell you about this bomb salad I just made. And just understanding that it, it fuels you and that food is information. And I don't think I ever looked at it that way until a few years ago of understanding like what you're putting in your body is what you're asking it to do. So if you're putting fatty foods in your, your body and fried foods in your body and soda and juices, you're telling your body, I don't really care how you run. I don't, I don't care what, you know, I don't care what you, you know, what you need. And so for me, Again, it all goes back to the conversations of what it is that we need in order to be successful. Great point. Great mm -hmm. point. The whole fruits in juice thing, I know that we'll get more into that <laughs> later, but Amber, what's your thoughts? Well, she pretty much hit all the points, but I want to hit, before you go into um, everything that she mentioned, um, you got to understand that being uh, physically healthy and having great wellness, you got to have your mind, body, and spirit in line. Yeah. So when you, before you even make your decision of you want to exercise or you want to eat healthy, everything needs to connect, whether that is you figuring out a, um, a schedule that will work for you. Because I know a lot of us are very busy and we say that we want to do something, but mentally we're stressed out or uh, spiritually we're not there or our body is not feeling the best at that moment. So I believe that you also should always prep before you decided to make any decision when you want to eat healthy or be physically fit if you would like to be. And I also want to emphasize on um, health doesn't have a look. And I know um, a lot of people will look at somebody who preaches health and they look a certain way and they're like, oh, she'll know what she's talking about. But she can be just as she can be healthier than a smaller, leaner person because health is more inside, it's more internal than external you have to feed your body in terms to show the external part to show that you are healthy and you are experiencing great wellness so i just really wanted to touch on that that um, whether you have to first of all i know if you're trying to have great nutrition which is a challenge for a lot of people you have to really plan 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 your week out plan your days out if you can't plan your week out if you want to exercise, you have to plan it as well. So if you're not a good person with planning um, things out for yourself to be able to execute, I'm very real with my clients. Uh, I give them tough love. I give them to them straight. Everything sounds good. In that moment, you might say, yes, I want to be this great person, this healthy person, this physically fit person. But I'm going to question you and say, okay, how are you preparing yourself to be that person? What are your steps? Let me see. Like, write it down. Put it in front of your face. Like, I need to make sure that you're actually going to execute what you say that you want to know. Also, figuring out your why. What is your why? Once you figure out your why, when you have those down moments, when you want to fall off, you can always revert back to your why. So being mentally, physically, and spiritually aligned before you make those decisions of trying to be a healthier you or making yourself a priority is extremely important. So I just want to make sure I touched on that. All great points, all great points. All of them have to be working together in order for them to actually work together. Because if you st are um, stuck, on an, an, stuck on an idea of what fit looks like, if you think that fit is a six pack and you never got a six pack, then you start to instantly compare yourself to, the other, mm -hmm. to other people. And then that's kind of when the mental health aspect of physical health kind of starts to butt heads a little bit. Because you're like, well, physically I'm doing all these things. I'm forcing myself to eat all these things, but mentally I'm not there because I'm not seeing what I thought I would get. And comparison is the thief of joy. So the main thing is to compare yourself 
to who you were last week, who you were when you started this journey, who you were yesterday, and giving yourself those small victories for eating that salad, giving yourself the, the small victory of finding a new way to enjoy salad. Like just experimenting and exploring within yourself and finding new things that are fun and exciting and planning. Cause just the way when we want to get into school, we make a plan for that. When we want to have a successful relationship, may that be um, friendship level or romantic, there is a plan for that. Almost everything that we do, there's a plan. So why is it that when it comes to our health, we start to kind of make a shift that it's just supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. A plan has to be in place in order for you to be sex mm -hmm. successful no matter what you do. And when it comes down to yourself, when you have to battle your, your inner demons and you have to battle your negative self-talk and comparison and doubt and shame and guilt and past traumas and past family histories of like certain meals that we shouldn't be eating, <laughs> but we still eat it out of culture, which then, which then aids to all the issues that we're having now. So it really does go hand in hand. We have to do the two together. So being that we kind of just um, finished that conversation, now kind of lies the question of like, so what foods do you guys recommend? So we're talking about how these things really do connect. But now let's really like dive into the like those really um, much needed conversations of like, what foods do you recommend when we're trying to target certain parts of ourselves and certain parts of our journey? So let me know, ladies, what foods do you recommend? Um, what foods like should you stay away from? Which foods are the best? Which foods have you used to heal yourself from some of the things that you shared from earlier? Okay. Um, briefly, so I like to tell people that listen to your body first. Your body will tell you what your body needs. So if you're experiencing a lot of ash, your skin is dry, you're looking like an alligator, you're dehydrated. So you need some water. So you always have to listen to your body. If you eat something, you instantly get bloated. I know a lot of people are gluten intolerant. So as soon as you eat some gluten and you are bloated, stay away from it. Um, if you, I, mean, I know, I know a lot of people will start having allergies probably in their twenties and thirties. And it's like, where does this allergy come from? Where you probably ate, either ate it too much or your body needs some type of detoxing. I am a queen of detoxing. That is pretty much what I push. I have um, tummy tea toxins. I have different medicinal teas coming out. And I try to tell people you need to detox. And I promise you, as soon as you detox, that allergy will go away. So always eat whole foods. I recommend if you can't grow it in your backyard, you probably don't need ready to eat it. I'm not saying that you have to be plant-based, but if you're in a space where you are mentally ill, physically ill, I tell my clients to pull back from a lot of the processed foods, the meats, and go through the healing process and eating more plant-based food, foods. And that's pretty much what I did to um, heal my disease is to eat foods that fuel my body, foods that wasn't made in the, in the lab, foods that I can actually grow in my backyard. So um, just listen to your body. Your body is really talking to you and you really need to listen. As soon as you listen, you will see wonders, I promise you. Yes. <laughs> what about you? So I think that our diets in general, I like, just like Amber said, like, there's no one, you know, work that you should stick to in terms of what your body needs. So for example, I have a lot of friends that are vegan, but they eat a lot of carbs. Carbs are not a part of my day-to-day -day diet. So I eat meat, but there is the understanding of like having leaner meats and, you know, like having more meatless meals. So for me, like in terms of like what I buy on a weekly or monthly basis from the supermarket, I stick to spring mix berries. I have a lot of green juice that's like rooted in celery and, you know, like sometimes ginger, a little bit of lime. Um, I make, like I said, I make all of my salad dressings. If I do have milk, it's a little bit of it. And I add turmeric to it. So I have like golden milk to help like reduce inflammation and pain in my body. So that way I can recover from my workouts. Um, I just really try to be intentional with what it is that I, that I put in my body. And so if I am having meat, it's a salad with tuna or maybe some chicken. Um, I try to stay away from red meats as much as I can. I will never stop eating steak. I always say that to everyone that, that that's just my own personal <laughs> thing. If I die two years earlier because I went to Ruth Chris twice a year, I'm good with that. However, you know, like in general on like a daily um, and weekly basis. I'm really, you know, just like mindful of that. If I want something sweet, instead of going to ice cream, I might freeze some grapes. Um, I stick to water. Water is really important. Alkaline water for me personally is something that I use um, really consistently. And that's just because I had acid reflux issues in the past. And now I no longer have them um, because I, I drink a lot of aloe vera and I have uh, alkaline water on a daily basis. So 
I would say those are the things that I stick to. But again, um, I would suggest like working with a nutritionist to figure out what your body needs specifically. And then again, like pay attention, like Amber said, to what happens afterwards. There were some foods that I would eat that I would have headaches afterwards. And I was like, yeah, so we're not going to eat those things again. You know, so just like so just those little things that you do in order to build up like, you know, a regime that your body enjoys, you know, the food that you, you consume. 100% agree with both of you ladies. Um, for context, I am vegan. <laughs> um, and then for even more context, I'm a Jamaican vegan at that. So oh you could only imagine my family when I decided to go vegan. They were just like, but what about oxtail? <laughs> <laughs> but what about, and I was like, I can make all those things with chickpeas, just saying. <laughs> you can't. No? Um, but like for me, just to piggyback off what you guys um, were saying, the way I basically do it, I do not take my veganism too seriously if that makes sense because then it makes it like a, it makes it more into like a like a restricted type of diet and that's not the type of life i'm trying to live i'm trying to be really i'm trying to just have fun i'm trying to enjoy the food i'm eating so basically i just use my hands and i eat through handfuls so that's like a like a tip that i do i basically eat through handfuls and what i do is like for example i'm gonna have rice i have a handful of rice handful of that handful of that and i kind of make sure that i touch all the different parts of the food um pyramid to make sure that i am you know, well healthy and I get all my different vitamins, but I basically eat through handfuls. And after I've grabbed a handful of everything, usually that's more than enough for me. And then also just to do your research as well, like just learn um, what has iron in it, what has antioxidants in it, what X, Y, and Z, so that you can just be more um, aware of what you're putting in your body. So it looks like we are almost done and there's so much more that I want to talk to you guys about. Um, but I do want to just um, reach over to the chat and let you guys know, like you can start to put your questions down there because we're going to be answering some of those really soon. So if you have any questions for these amazing ladies and myself included, please just write um, your questions over in the chat. Um, but lastly, I just wanted to ask you ladies, how has your hair played a role in all of this? Um, I know when I lack a lot of minerals and nutrients, my hair starts thinning out and uh, starts to shed a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to uh, eat a lot of minerals and, 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 and nutrients. I know people are on the big sea moss little, I don't want to call it like a phase, but it's very important. If you can't get your nutrients and minerals in food and different supplements, I do promote uh, sea moss. So. Yeah. Um, so for me with hair care, I mean, it's just really important to me. I am a natural hair girl. I, I love, you know, exploring just different things with hair. Um, so I just I just say like deep condition your hair once a week. Pay attention again, like with the foods that you're eating. It does help to strengthen your hair. Um, and then just also just like be mindful that with like exercising your hair, you know, it will change in terms of like, you know, like it will frizz up. That's OK. You know, and just embracing the reality that like your hair measurement at times might have to change due to whatever it is that you do. So like I'm a swimmer. So I wear my hair natural now and I had to take out my extensions and I embrace that what that shift looks like. And when I want to put some protective styles, you know, in my hair, I do. But for, for me. I've, I've really like let go of like what my hair looks like. For me, I'm just focused on like physical fitness and knowing that it's growing and which it is. It's grown more than ever and I swim all the time. Well, for me, my hair is something that helped a lot with kind of being more aware of what I'm putting in my body. Because when I first went natural, I was like, okay, I don't want to put chemicals. I don't want to do this. So that, like, that put me in the habit of reading the label. And then I started to realize that if I'm reading the label for my hair care products, why am I not reading the labels for what I'm actually physically putting in my body, what I'm actually physically putting on my skin? Why am I treating my hair like it's this untouchable thing and my body doesn't count? So once I kind of started realizing that that's a trend that I was doing just with my hair, I started to move that trend over to my body as well. And then kind of shifting my perspective on my hair, which also changed the perspective on my body as well. Looking at my hair and realizing that it's gonna grow and it's gonna break and it's gonna be good times and it's gonna be bad times. It's always gonna be evolving. Looking at my body and my physical um, wellness journey as, um, through the same lens, telling myself, something I tell myself often, I'm 26 now for context. Um, I tell myself that this is a woman's body. It's growing, it's evolving it will consistently change. I will never look exactly like this for the rest of my life. And kind of when you put that thought in your mind, it really changes your perspective on everything. So it's like, I, there was times when I was extremely um, fit. I had a six pack at one time, guys. <laughs> and 
now I'm almost 30 pounds um, heavier and my hair has been cut since then and I feel just as holistically well. Um, we have a question from Flex and Fly. Hey girl. Um, it says, literally just posted my four main herbs and immune system boosting video yesterday that consists that consists of iris sea moss. Yes. Um, I um, I live on it and three other herbs is so important. Do you guys have um, have a herb routine? Hmm. Well, why don't you ladies start with that question? Do you guys have a herb routine? I don't have a herb routine, but I do have my go-to herbs that I go that I um, consume when I have certain con like conditions. Like I know that if I feel backed up or constipated, or if I'm having a lot of cravings, wormwood is really good. Uh, it attacks your parasites in your gut, which parasites are the devil. So when you are having a lot of sweet and salty cravings, that means you have a lot of parasites in your gut, and that needs to be cleaned out. So when I have my moments, because I'm not perfect, and I want to have a cookie, and I'm having way too many cookies, I know that I need to make me a wormwood uh, tea, or if I feel like I need to clean some of my blood, I do. So it depends on how I feel in that moment, mm -hmm. then I will go straight to that herb and drink it and do a detox for that herb for like seven days, and then it will go away. So, yeah. So I have a, a tea, so tea blends that I use. So like for me, I'm actually like exploring more now in terms of herbs, but there is a tea company that I use by the name of Zentanical. And so I use just different types of blends that they have. So depending on if I'm having cramps, if I need to detox, if I'm having really bad headaches. And so I use their tea blends, but I do want to like explore more on my own, but I do also um, have my own sea moss that I, that I have every day too. Awesome. Um, and then for me, I um, you would think I would be more herbs, <laughs> but um, I put herbs more on my skin um, than I um, ingest it. So I love tea tree when I feel like I need detox. Um, I'm someone who gets heat rashes very often. Um, so that helps me a lot. Aloe vera, I don't know if that's technically a herb, but it's my life. And lavender keeps me calm and centered. We have a question for you, uh, here, Amber. Um, what is your what is recommended for severe migraines um, that's resulting to seizures? I'm I'm tired of medicate of medication and was told I need to holistic care. Any thoughts for her? Um, so I like to tell people with those type of questions that I cannot recommend any type of supplements because I will have to dig deeper on what you actually consume in your body. And then once I figure that out, then I can tell you what you can possibly remove. Because a lot of things that we, that happened to us physically is what we in, what we put in our bodies internally. So I'll actually have to get more like one-on-one -on -one time with you to see what your lifestyle is like, what your eating habits is like, because you can't treat herbs and supplements like medications because that's something that you got to make a lifestyle. You can't just take a uh, basil and think it's going to actually fix your problem. So I have to really, really uh, talk to you and give you a great answer that specifically go for your condition. Okay, awesome. Um, it looks like we have one more question here. I always hear that it is damaging to wash your hair too much, um, but being an athlete, I want to wash out sweat and dirt. Is this unhealthy? Or should I use dry shampoo? Yes, and I feel like this would be a great- Co-wash, co-wash, <laughs> do not. Dry shampoo is, I personally feel like it's not for us, uh, but co-wash, I use um, Pattern Beauty and I also use Miel Organics. That's one of my favorite lines. I love their uh, line for type four hair, which is pomegranate and honey. So I use that as well. So co-wash, I co-wash my hair on a daily basis and it works well for me. So I would say to do that. And so again, with, like you said, you're, you are um, like sweating more. And so you're having buildup and dirt. So you do want to not ignore that in terms of workouts, because when you're, when you're sweating all of that, like, especially like, you know, like for like your forehead and that, you know, like where that buildup typically is for me, Co-wash, 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 but do not use shampoo. Don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and something that I could um, recommend, um, I don't wash my hair every day. I'm not an athlete, which I was. Um, I wash my hair like once every two weeks. Something that I love using though is apple cider vinegar um, to cleanse my hair. So if that's something that you may be interested in trying, I do suggest it. But thank you so much for your question, Jada. Um, so we are approaching the end of our panel. And I want to thank all of you ladies um, for being a part of this and everyone that was with us today joining in as well. Um, so ladies, any goodbye remarks that you would like to share with our audience before we head on out? 
I would just say thank you guys so much for having us. And just to remember that wellness is a very personal journey. And so just be patient with yourself as you go on it and just look forward to what your life will look like in the process. Absolutely. I definitely agree. Just be very gentle with yourself. And it's all about balance. You do not have to be perfect. Don't be mad at yourself when you mess up or slip up. It's a it's a process. It's a lifestyle. So I was I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm so excited that I met you guys and everybody in the comments. I love y'all. <laughs> and again, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm happy that we were able to have this conversation. If you want to learn more about these ladies, their ID handles are there as well. If you want to learn more about the self love organization, bridging the gap between mental health and self love through therapy and sisterhood, please reach out to me. My ID name is here as well. And again, have a great day, ladies. And we hope to see you guys all soon. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye, ladies. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are going to move right along into a very exciting and new edition. Literally, like two days oh ago. Oh my God, you guys, like this next session literally just happened like two days ago. And Shonda and I was like, like, no, we have to make we this happen. Like, there's no way that we cannot have this conference and not talk about the importance of sunscreen as black women, especially with the weather changing. Um, and I just, I don't, I don't know nothing else to say. You know what, I'm just gonna give it to the next two ladies to come in and wow you. And those two ladies will be our moderator, Destiny, who I will pop on the screen now. Hi, Destiny. Hi, hey, hey. how's everyone doing? Great. Hey. <laughs> lovely keynote speaker who knows everything about everything when it comes to black girls and sunscreen. With her brand, Black Girl Sunscreen, here is the founder, Shantae. Ladies, please do take it away. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here. I am Destiny. I'm a creative social media strategist based in Harlem, New York. And I am so excited to be here today. And we're just going to dive right in. So um, we have Shantae. So Shantae, if you can just introduce yourself, give us a little background, and also let us know what inspired you to create Black Girl Sunscreen. Like, what was that moment where you realized, like, I got to make this happen? Hi. Um, so I'm Shantae, the owner and creator of Black Girl Sunscreen. And I'm going to take you back to when I needed to make my first big girl decision. And that's when I decided to move away from college. Um, it was only three hours away, but it was a still a big distance for my family and I to get acclimated to. And um, that's where I had to start making really risky moves and, and, and risky decisions. So going to college and then deciding after college to do my master's in Miami. So I packed up my car, drove down the 95 and um, moved to Miami after I graduated. So that was my second big decision. I started working after I got my master's and then um, spending 12 years in corporate America, I decided to transition out. So while I was in transition, I was like, hey, let me make another really big decision and relocate to Los Angeles, California. Um, and that's when I pretty much left all the old for the new. And coming to California got my creative juices flowing. I was just in a really different um, space, a different environment with different energy. And I am a woman of the sun, so I enjoy hiking. And that's where um, I wasn't really introduced to sunscreen. I just felt like it was needed because I was in the sun so much, but mm -hmm. I, couldn't find, I couldn't find anything for my skin. And I jumped on the computer like, hey, uh, is there a sunscreen for dark skin? Like literally uh, typing in the keywords. There's a sunscreen for dark skin, brown girls, black girls. And I came up so um, shorthanded and that's where, that's where it came about. But really the inspiration isn't just about not finding a sunscreen for darker complexion, but being, but being able to take that risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, life. cool. Thank you for that. Um, one thing that you said about like finding a sunscreen specifically for like darker tones, I'm really interested to hear more about that. So like, I, I imagine it's like 
even for me when I wear sunscreen, sometimes there's like that white cast that comes or like that that stickiness or like whatever it is, it's like, it's not very for our skin. So in what way did black girl sunscreen kind of change the conversations and beauty, especially with like black women? Well, that was that was our, our biggest challenge really. And that was really what was going through my mind when um, I came up with the idea was, are women of color going to, to, to buy this, right? Because the misconception is that we don't need it. Um, but I am my own customer. And in my mind, I said, okay, I'm not the only dark skinned girl that is looking for sunscreen. So let me see what I could do here. Mm -hmm. And that's really, that's, that's the challenge, right? And then, you know, talking about disrupting the, the beauty industry, that wasn't necessarily my intention. That's that's kind of just what happened because this was something that was not new because the conversation has been had. It's just never really been important enough for anybody to do anything about it, especially, you know, the larger brands, um, more conservative brands. Yeah. So when we talk about disrupting the, the industry, it's it's about, you know, being unapologetically who I am. And that's why the name is Black Girl Sunscreen because I want women of color to know it's for them. And that what it's within itself is a disruptor. Mm -hmm. okay. So we created a lane for women to come behind us to now start talking about sun care for women of color. Okay, yeah. So let's talk about the importance of sunscreen specifically for people of color because you know i grew up my family was like you don't need sunscreen what's that and now like in my adulthood i'm just now realizing the importance of protecting your skin mm -hmm. um can we just talk about like that myth and just i just want to hear your perspective on that my perspective is that i grew up in a household that didn't have sunscreen we didn't know what sunscreen was um actually i, I went to camp um one summer and um the, the white kids were wearing bug spray and sunscreen. So um, my mother just told me just to, to go outside and play. I'm black, like you're <laughs> right? So, so I, I grew up with this notion of, because I had this built-in shield that I, I didn't need it. And the shield was, was our melanin. Mm -hmm. um, so fast forward to today, I didn't start using sunscreen until I created Black Girl Sunscreen. And that's mm -hmm. because of you know, the, the white sticky cast that it left on my complexion. As you can see, I'm a dark skinned woman, right? And mm -hmm. that's just not okay to not look like yourself and, and feel like yourself. Um, so in terms of um, sunscreen and, and, and black women and um, just everything that we've, we've done so far is that we've created a product that makes women feel good and look good. Right, because nobody wants to go to that pool party, put on sunscreen, and then it's oozing through their makeup, or just not feel like themselves, and and that's really the purpose. And you know, as we continue on with the brand, our mission and vision is to continue and and really educate uh, women of color about sun protection. Um, you know, it it serves as a uh, dual, a multi-purpose product, so a preventative measure against skin cancer and melanoma, mm -hmm. and then on the cosmetic side hyperpigmentation, dark spots, uh, premature aging. So, you know, we, ha we have the, the myth black doesn't crack and it really doesn't, right? Because we're here looking really youthful and vibrant, but, but how do we, how do we, how do we pre preserve that, that youthfulness, right? Mm -hmm. And SPF is, is part of a solution that I feel like women of color have been, um, not really told. Yeah. So how do you, like, what do you think is the best way to just kind of raise awareness? Because it's so important and like, it's ridiculous that we're just now getting to this point where we're putting on sunscreen. And I think it's so powerful what you said when you said you haven't, you didn't use sunscreen until you created one that was specifically for your skin. Yeah. So like, what, what do you think is a great way to wait, like raise more awareness on this topic and this issue? Um, to continue what we're doing, um, we started off um, literally launching on social media, right? Mm -hmm. Social media is the way of marketing today. It's um, how we are bringing attention to the brand, to ourselves, even as creatives. So we started just literally posting images of women having fun in the sun, right? Because that's also another misconception is that Black people don't go outside and swim. They don't go outside for barbecues, right? Memorial Day is tomorrow. So are the black people gonna be in the center? They're gonna be in the shade. Which one is it, right? Yeah. The one is that we're gonna be in the shade because we don't wanna get darker or whatever it is. 
So um, the way we're continuing, you know, um, the message is is what we're doing now, staying very, very active um, across all social media platforms, you know, having these conversations with you and the one ladies that are, are hosting this, right? And then partnering with our brick and mortar um, relationships, um, other dot-com platforms that offer skincare products to brown and black girls, um, you know, participating in, let's say, these trade shows when the world was open, but now have moved virtually. Um, and then having a, a, a partnership with a major retailer, Black Girls mm -hmm. Central Union became the first indie brand to have major distribution in a national retailer. That's mm -hmm. huge because it's yeah. because all of the women that are on this platform watching mm -hmm. us have this conversation, listening to us have this conversation, mm -hmm. catapulted it, the brand and actually brought awareness to the community about wearing sunscreen. So when you ask me like, how do we continue this message is to continue doing what we're doing. It's telling our sister, our mother, our cousin, our grandmother, our auntie, anyone that will listen and say, hey, did you know that just because you're black, you should wear sunscreen. And yes, black does crack. You can get sunburned while you're on that cruise. And you oh, know, yes, <laughs> you can. <laughs> you know what, girl? You got, you got a dark spot. So the number of reasons, mm -hmm. so we had dermatologists, you know, here um, on the stage uh, earlier. And um, the number one reason why women of color are going into the dermatologist is for hyperpigmentation. Mm -hmm. um, so SPF is is something that can help with that. Um, so when we talk about continuing that conversation, it's all of these that need to be included within that conversation. What are why is sunscreen helpful to your skin? Why is why should you incorporate it into your daily skincare regimen? Why? Why not just wear it? Um, like why not just to wear it during travel vacation, but to wear it every single day. And that's what we're trying to do is really incorporate um, wearing sunscreen in our everyday behavior. You know how you got your edges laid, right? Mm -hmm. with, your, with your edge control, it's yeah. really, you know, looking for your for your sunscreen a, as well. So yes. just if you brush your teeth, you put on your, your sunscreen. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we're gonna continue to, 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 to move forward with, with the movement is to bring products to different skin types Right, mm -hmm. this is something that you could look forward to for Black Girl Sunscreen is creating products for different skin types, so it is easier to incorporate in your in your in your everyday behaviors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's so important to kind of shift how we look at sunscreen because I've always thought of it as something I will take along with me to my trips. Like I love to travel, so whenever I know I'm going to a place where I'm going to be in the sun all the time. I bring my sunscreen, but I think we have to shift our mind and say like, hey, sunscreen should be a part of our beauty routine, like period. Like it's something that we have to continue to use. Um, but so, in order for that to happen, you need to be a believer, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so typically if, if somebody could just say something to you and you're just like, yeah, okay. But if you actually see results, that's mm -hmm. when you're like, ah, this, this is working. So mm -hmm. it, it's one thing to say, okay, girl, put on your sunscreen. But then mm -hmm. if this girl puts on their sunscreen and they come back from whatever they're doing and they don't have a burn or their skin isn't um, thirsty, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. If they're still thirsty, then then that's how you start to shift that 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 mindset. So mm -hmm. it, it has to be tried out first. You can't just say, no, I don't need this. Well, that might be true, but why don't you try it with it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you kind of hinted at the future of Black Girl Sunscreen. So if you can give us a little peek into the future and what like, what can we expect to see? Um, so I mentioned it before, um, you know, the way we're gonna continue the conversation is, you know, um, give the ladies what they want. We are very engaged in, in socials. We hear what the community is asking for. And that's what we wanna do. We want to be able to put Black Girl Sunscreen in the hands of all brown and black girls that want to protect their skin from the sun. Um, so then, you know, this really just trickles into something bigger, becoming mass and becoming global. So everybody can access what they want for their skin and feel good, and look good, while doing it. Um, and we have everyone here on this platform to thank. You know, these are my final, wor my final words. It's, it's just really thank you everyone that has 
supported Black Girl Sunscreen in some way or another, but if it's from liking a post to telling someone, hey, protect your skin, or hey, try out Black Girl Sunscreen, or hey, going to this big box retailer and, and picking up a tube or, or two or three or four, whatever it is, thank you so, 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 so much. Yes, and thank you so much, Shante. Like I've learned something on this chat and I'm just so excited. Like I cannot wait to walk into a Target, like walk into the store and support the brand because it's so, so important that we just continue to support each other. And I'm just like so honored to have this conversation with you. And I'm so excited to see like the future of the brand. And yeah, but um, I think that's all we have for today. Um, and I think you kind of already said your final words, but if, if there's any other like points or anything else, I think um, we're, that's a wrap. <laughs> well, I see a question here. It says, uh, Shay, I wanted to know as an entrepreneur, what's the self-care routine must for you? I live for your sunscreen and get it on black and green. Thank you for loving us. Uh, love you all too. Um, you know, in this on this entrepreneur journey, um, I really keep it simple, but I do uh, have my mandatory steps, which is cleansing my face, then moisturizing it, um, then toning it, and last but not least, applying my black girl sunscreen, and that's in the house <laughs> or outside. And um, you know, she mentioned one of our partners, Black and Green, which is so dope because, like I said, it's because of our collaboration, you know, and building this community that um, has propelled us to that to just to keep forward and. Um, you know, as women of color, as black women, we must know how strong and powerful our dollar is because without it, we wouldn't be where we are today. Okay. Uh-oh. How, how often should we use sunscreen? Listen, um, I, me, I would tell you every single day, um, you know, not at night, just in, in the morning when you're doing your regular skincare routine, and then you should be good if you're just kind of maybe in your office or maybe even running just your daily routines. But if you're going to the beach or on a walk, you're gonna reapply every couple of hours. All right. So I think that may be the, are there any other questions? Okay. Good. So yeah, I think that is a wrap. <laughs> Uh-oh, you're on mute lady. I'm muted. No, <laughs> I just wanted to pop in and say thank you so much to the both of you for a very needed and necessary conversation. Please, you guys go follow Destiny at Afro Eclectic. She is amazing on the gram. Um, her content. Wait, wait, one second. Afro Eclectic. Eclectic. <laughs> the extra C always gets everyone. <laughs> eclectic. Please don't yes. be like me. Follow her at Afro Eclectic. Yes. And check her content because she is killing it on the gram. Thank and you. of course, support by Black. Go to your local Target. And Shantae, where else is Black Girl Sunscreen sold? So, um, you know, first and foremost, we have a website, blackgirlsunscreen.com. Um, you know, you could purchase it at um, your local Target. And then I would say, you know, during this time, it's important to support small businesses. So we are in um, some brick and mortars um, across the United States, as well as on other uh, .com platforms that speak to, to black and brown girls. So I would say, you know, just, just hop on Google and put in Black Girl Sunscreen, and there's so many different options for you to, to shop from. Um, but we would ask you to support, you know, the, the smaller businesses right now. And also go follow Black Girl Sunscreen on Instagram, as well as Shantae, whose Instagram is Shantae underscore for Lundy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but, but but most importantly, you know, this is um, you know, Black Girl Sunscreen. The movement is bigger, bigger than I am. Um, you know, we've started something that is is making waves and 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 it has people talking. So um, we just encourage everyone to just support. You know, forget about Shante underscore Lundy. It's really Black Girl Sunscreen because. Um, this is going to surpass me and and we need each other to to keep it going. Um, so just all black girl sunscreen stuff all day, every day, um, because in order to be recognized and, and to be seen and to be heard, 
we got to kick louder and scream and, and louder, louder and harder within this industry. Um, as I mentioned before, we're the only, you know, black owned brand within SunCare and the other big brands are watching us to see what we're doing, right? To see, oh, well, hey, you know, women of color weren't purchasing this before. How are they getting women of color to buy it? And now, oh, this is a market. So let's, let's target um, women of color now. To, to purchase sunscreen. Now you'll see, you know, multiracial, biracial, you know, and some black women in sunscreen ads um, from these from these bigger companies. So there's so many things that we've just put them onto. Um, so the reason why I say, you know, if you can support black girl sunscreen, please do, because, you know, the competition out there is fierce. And, you know, um, in terms of imposter syndrome, it's real. So why, why acknowledge a group now? Like what happened 10 years ago, you know, because sunscreen is not a new invention. It's been around for years. So why? So why now? You know, so I just went on this rant because you said, oh, <laughs> so Lundy, but, um, but it's important. Um, like it doesn't, it's not about me. It's really about our skin and us being healthy for, for years to come. Right. Because we're late in the game now. Right. So many of us haven't grown up with sunscreen around. Like what the heck is sunscreen? Like I don't need that shit. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not buying it. Yeah, literally. I don't need yeah. it. I don't. I don't. I don't want to do it. But you know, our lighter skin counterparts have been wearing it for years, and um, just been good and chilling. So huh, that's where I'm at. <laughs> and we thank you for yes. sharing your time with us, both you and Destiny. Once again, please go follow them on the gram um, and support them and all that they're doing. And ladies, I thank you from the bottom of my heart mm-hmm. for joining us today and pouring into us and we will stay connected. I appreciate you having me. Bye ladies. Have a good weekend, a good long weekend. You too. Bye. Awesome. Bringing Shonda back in. Hi. Oh my God. I just can't even, wow. We are nearing the end. Like this is it's not the end. You know how I feel about saying it's the end. It's just going to be a pause until the next great big thing that we have. Because we've said this a million and five times before in the beginning. We've said it in the emails. We've said it in our IG captions. This was just something that started what back before Shaw even texted me and brought to me this incredible vision that she had. This started with two girls in a Spelman dorm room who wanted to embark on journeys as journalists in the entertainment and music sector. And here we are today bringing you incredible women like Dr. Karen Kaga and Dr. Elise Love and meditations from Kelly Green and keynote speaking from Shantae Lundy and so much more. So it's not the end, it's just a pause until the incredible next thing that we're able to bring to you guys, which is for now, the portion of the um, event, sorry, cause I'm like getting really emotional, where you get to- Gosh, don't do that. Sorry, where you get to know Shaw and I as more than just the founders of BBW Con, but you all get to know us as human beings, as someone's daughter, as someone's friend, as each other's sisters. So I'm excited to kick off this conversation, this fireside chat, as I love to say, because I think fireside chat is just so intimate sounding and cute and cozy, um, entitled Vision, Purpose, and Passion. What's the difference? And what I want to start off with saying is it all starts with identifying, executing, and adapting the passions. And if you have a notebook, please feel free to write anything down that you see here, because like the rest of the ladies, we're going to be dropping them gems today. Okay. Cardi B, don't sue me. But <laughs> we really want to talk first about what it means to identify a personal brand. We oftentimes believe that branding is just creating an Instagram page and creating a hashtag and looking cute and whatnot. But it's it's more than that. I believe that Personally, a brand is something that people say about you when you're not in the room. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not in the room and people are, God forbid, saying, 
oh, Deshonda's, excuse my language for a second, but Deshonda's a bitch, or Deshonda drops the ball on projects, or Deshonda does A, B, and C, D that's negative. That's my brand because that's what people know me as. So I feel like as Black women, we have to work three times, four times, 10 times harder to make sure that our brand is on point and where it needs to be. Because truth be told, like I can talk about this all day, all night, but we have to work so, so much more meticulously and so much stronger and really touch, really to touch on the point that Shah brought up earlier about even being in the room. When we're in the room, we have to remind other people and ourselves why we're in the room. Like I'm, I was hired, weren't, wasn't I? My resume went through all these processes and I'm here for a reason. And I feel like that's the start of your brand, reminding yourself who you are and why you why you're where you're at today. Um, I would absolutely agree, but I also want to touch on something that you just said and kind of reach a little deeper into it per se, because I think there is sometimes a lot of confusion on brand versus reputation. Yeah. Um, your reputation, I personally feel like is something that you can control but you can't control in, in a lot of senses um, because your brand is something, it's, it's the idea you have, like, like DBW con is the brand, right? It's the idea in For real sure. life. It's the idea that's tangible that you are interacting with right now. Um, the reputation, hopefully after you all sign off, um, you, you feel the love and, and the hard work that went into this and the genuine, um, desire to bring black women together on today and and not even just like on my birthday but literally just to bring women together to fellowship to learn to love on each other especially during this time um because i feel like in going off a little bit but still staying on the topic a lot of the time we're depicted as as caddy and that we're like crabs in a barrel and we don't want to help each other win and and we don't want to support each other when it's not like that um, and it goes back into the conversation I was having with Blake, um, Kalia, and Darian when it comes to talking about the culture. There is such a strength of sisterhood and love amongst Black women that a lot of people don't choose to focus on in the media. They rather yeah. they rather reality TV show us, right? Yeah. Because it's entertaining. It gets views. You know, people love to click in it because it gives you a sense of distraction from your real life, right? Um, but there is just such strength in numbers, especially when it comes to black women beyond our, our buying power. But when we love on and support each other, things like today are possible. Um, but to go back and keep us on track, when you're building a brand, it's important to have a reason, a purpose, a message and a goal, right? Um, so for example, when, when hashing out this idea, I was just like, I knew I wanted to do something. And honestly, in the beginning, I didn't zero in on just black women. I was like, I just want to bring people together to fellowship and to learn and everything like that. And then I was like, but what about focusing on black women? You know, during this time, we haven't really been in the forefront of the conversation. Um, of course, our health is our first priority and you know you want to watch the news in moderation but i also think it's important to check in amongst each other right um and that was like that became the center of this brand like how do we successfully give resources to but also check in and provide a space for black women to come together where there's no judgment right where we can just fellowship we can love on each other we can talk about all the important topics that are prevalent to us. Um, and that just goes into just, you know, building the imagery behind the brand, right? Because now you have a reason, you have a, a, a purpose, you have a desire or a goal for for um, your niche market, as they like to say <laughs> in business. Um, and you take that and you just build on it, right? And you create the identity of your brand. But when it comes to the reputation aspect of it all, that's something that you can only hope that your audience receives. Like you can only hope that those who are watching and those who have tuned in today understand that, you know, 
this wasn't for me or me and Chanda. This wasn't for any of the panelists that, you know, spoke to you today, but this was for you all. All of you in the comment section, we really just came together to give you resources to make a space for you for what, four hours going on where you just yeah. seen, where you feel comfortable, where you feel loved, like, you know, a time for you to just center yourself and quiet the noise, which I think was such an important part of this conference. And when mm -hmm. and I was discussing, you know, the run of show, we were like, we definitely need some type of break in the conference because one, we didn't just want to um, just load all of this. Throw so much at you at one time. Um, and also because like someone said earlier when Kelly was still on the screen that like, you don't see us in, in the yoga spaces, right? We think that yoga is just something that they do. When it's like, no, health and wellness is for all of us. We have to stop, we have to stop, what's the word I'm looking for? Excluding ourselves from mm -hmm. certain genres and certain um, health aspects of life. And of course we can say that, you know, they don't put us in the advertisements or they don't advertise to us, but that doesn't mean that we can't go out and get it for ourselves. We can't go out and show up, you know, in these spaces and make space for us because I, I, honestly speaking, a lot of the time, no one's going to hand you the key to the door. That's just yeah. sad reality of it all. We, we're not really given the keys. We're not, we're not given directions to the building. We're not told even which door to enter in. You sometimes you just have to go out here and you have to get it on your own. You have to find it on your own. I definitely think that kind of backtracking a bit, you really talked about, you know, building a brand. It's important when you're when you're building that brand and even when let's go off of the door analogy, analogy. Let's go off of the door analogy for a second. It's really about identifying your purpose because we can ha we can sit here and have conversations about not having keys to the door but it's important to know what door you want to go into because you can be like oh i'm i'm looking for i'm looking for the building but you don't know if it's building a building d building c building 4 building 10 you don't know any of that so what you have to do is really look inside of yourself one second i'm so while she steps away for a moment. I'm not, sorry, um, something was ringing. So what is most important is for you to figure out your why. Shaw and I would not be here today if we didn't really think about who we are in relation to our relationships with ourselves, with our community, with our family, with our friends. I can say for myself, Personally, if it wasn't for my journey in mental health, if it wasn't for my suicide attempt, is it if it wasn't for all of the jobs that I've quit, if it wasn't for all the friendships that have failed, if it wasn't for all the jobs that I never got, I wouldn't be where I am today, which poured into myself and my well-being and allowed me to identify, okay, I'm going through all this stuff and I know that I want to give back, but how? It's really about thinking about what you want to do and how you want to give back and what legacy you want to leave. I know that for myself as a mental health advocate, I feel like it's so important to get the message to everybody and to break the stigma about mental health, but there is something about me connecting with black women and children that really feeds my purpose. Because for black women, I know that there aren't a lot of people that look like me. When I went to my therapist, I was so shocked that she was a down ass black woman because only 2% of psychiatrists in the APA are black. Only 2%. And there's a lot of psychiatrists out in the world. When it, when it comes to children, I want to be that trusted adult that I feel at times that I didn't have when I was in school. I want to be that adult that my nephews and my niece and my colleagues can come to. I want to be that public speaker when I go to a conference and people say, you changed my life and I've never met them before. My purpose isn't because I want to be in front of hundreds of people like you all. My purpose is to tell my story and touch somebody. So when you are building a brand, when Shaw and I were building BBWCon, 
we didn't do it for us. This isn't for our health. This isn't for our well-being. This isn't because we were bored on a Sunday. We did it because we knew that our purpose was greater than just Shaw and I. We knew that it was something that could pour into you all and then you all could pour into other people, which will eventually lead to more conferences or the women that are connecting with one another now. We see you all in the comments. We've been peeping you all day. We love the sisterhood. We love it so much. And this is exactly why we did this. We want each and every one of you to feel that sense of community and transparency. I saw that somebody earlier in here said that they're a cancer survivor. And that's incredible that you're sharing that. Somebody earlier said that they are also a suicide attempt survivor in the beginning of the comments. The fact that you all are here standing today mm -hmm. and building this community, we don't want you to just celebrate Shaw and I, celebrate yourselves and know that you all can do this too. Absolutely. Um, and also when it comes to I want to speak to something that it's on topic, but it's veering off of what Shonda just said. And I think that this is a very important aspect of brand building and, and having an idea and figuring out how to grow that idea. I know there's someone out there because it's someone used to be me, but you do not have to do this alone. Yep. You do not in any way, shape or form have to do this alone. And I know that especially as black women, we are so used to uplifting everyone else, helping everyone else and then helping ourselves. Um, but you have to realize that. And I'm speaking to myself as well, that when you put an idea out into the world. You will be amazed at what it can become. Um, if you follow me on the gram, I posted uh i posted on the i posted on instagram last night that we had hit 500 tickets uh mm -hmm. and that happened a little bit before midnight and i literally honestly speaking burst into tears because i couldn't fathom the i the, like the actuality of it all just this idea you know being something that i wrote down in a notebook in my room one day while trying to figure out the new normal and also work from home and all of that. And it became this, like there's still 117 of you rocking out with us who have been with us since 12 o'clock this afternoon. Right. And I say all of that to say that I don't know if this could have happened without everyone that contributed to this idea. And I know it's scary. It, it's so scary to put yourself out there. I can be the first one to tell you, like it's it's terrifying, right? Yeah. But there is such a power and a beauty in sharing your ideas with the right people. That's what I will say. You have to find the right people to nurture and grow your ideas. Because when I first was like, I wanna put on a conference, I wanna bring women together, and I was like, okay, well, I can but I can do only but so much in beauty. Like, how do I make this inclusive? How do I make this bigger? And then I was like, my best friend is like all things wellness. Beauty and wellness coincide. Like they just have to. And like I said earlier before, I don't know why there is not enough conversation about how beauty and wellness overlap because you really can't have one without the other, especially when it comes to your health and your physical appearance and how we talked about skin and nutrition and your weight fluctuating and stress and everything like mm -hmm. that. Um, and when I gave this idea to Shonda, I, I didn't know that it was going to catapult into what it is today and to have- 700 or y'all. To have spent the last like what, three and a half hours hearing from 16, 16 amazing black women who touch so many different aspects of the beauty and wellness industries has really blown me away because I, I'm sitting here right now and I'm just like, what if I kept that idea in a notebook? We would not be here today. If I didn't share that idea with Shonda, 
where would we be if these women who we reached out to to pull in to this to pull into the conference today said no you know if i never shared that idea with them we wouldn't be here and i think that there's such an importance in finding a team finding the right team, finding a process that works for you because i i promise you sorry for the cars passing by but <laughs> Um, I promise you that we are better together. We are so much stronger together, especially as Black women, especially navigating these two industries um, where we're not we're not really the focal point. We're not in the the boardrooms mainly. So it's important to create spaces of our own. Um, but I, I, that was like one thing that I was so like nailed on the head with. I was like by us for us, like every everything, including the interface that you're watching right now was created by black women. Yep. The panels, the conversations, the questions, all of this was by us for us. And, and I couldn't have done this without every single person who has grazed your screen today. So if you have an idea, don't let it die in a notebook. And I know it's we we hear the conversation of, you know, write it down and make it real, but you have to write it down, make it real, and put action behind it. We we have so many ideas that we've written in notebooks and we've placed those notebooks in the corners of our homes. But if nothing else, let this moment be a testament of what can happen when you just go for it. Start with what you have, start with who you know. Literally, you guys, a good email, a good media kit, a good press release will get you a long way than you can imagine. And I, I definitely believe you, A, you said a lot of great things, but we also want to express the importance that Sean and I are only 25 and 24 years old. And we're still figuring out life as we as we go. It would be such a lie if we sat here and said that we have a manual or a kit or a step by step process to get to where we were today. Because truth is, we don't. If I got it in the mail, I haven't gotten it. Somebody probably stole it from me. I don't know, but we just haven't gotten it. I believe that we also don't talk enough about the fact that it's OK to not know what you're doing. It's okay to have a million passions. It's okay to love a million things. I have a billion and five different things that I wanna do. And I've only probably successfully done three of them. And that's okay because there's no timeline to success. There's no clock that you have to follow. There's no straight path to success. I dropped out of grad school and I thought that that was going to be the number one thing that would launch me into my journalism and public relations career. And it didn't. And that's okay. And by doing that, I figured out what I didn't want to do. If there's anybody out here who has a job that they don't like, or they have a product that they don't know how to catapult, or even in their personal lives, they're in a relationship or a friendship that they're not too sure is aligned with their spiritual and emotional and mental well being. That's okay. It's totally okay to not be okay. It's okay to not know what the hell you're doing. I sit in my room many a days and say, you know what, Shonda, I don't, what, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, but I'm gonna figure it out. And that's okay because I have to keep having those check-ins with myself. Check in with your sisters. I check in with Shaw and my cousin Alexis, who's sitting with Shaw right now, and tell them all the time, I have no clue what I'm doing. I will have billions of wins. I will have a lot of articles go up. Shaw will go to a lot of events and write a lot of things for GMA, but we will still be honest with ourselves and say, we're doing great and we're doing fabulous, but we're still figuring it out because Fact of the matter is we we don't, and I don't want to lie and say that we do. Yeah. We want to, and we'll get there, but it's it's not in our ministry to have it all together today. And quite frankly, I feel like if Shaw and I had everything together, we probably wouldn't be able to be as transparent and as honest as we're being with y'all 
right now. We have gone through so many ups and downs and fails and wins together. We originally wanted to do a podcast together. We tried twice, I think probably three times. <laughs> and the stars just didn't align and it, it just wasn't so for us to ever have the correct recording schedule or for us to be in the state at the same time because I would sometimes travel to see my dad or see my mom or she would be at an event or she would have to work late. And we, we got frustrated sometimes like, damn, we really wanna do this together. We really wanna do something together. And all of those, all of those failed attempts let like it, it brought us to a win. It brought us to BBW Con. It brought us to all of you who are watching and supporting. And truth be told, if COVID-19 didn't, don't get me wrong, Miss Rona needs to go at some point. But if COVID-19 wasn't here and the world wasn't up in flames and I wasn't a full-time freelancer and Shaw was kicking off her YouTube channel and she and I did this podcast successfully, we wouldn't be here today. So it's totally fine to say you have no idea what you're doing and that you're figuring it out. It's totally fine to say, I don't want to do this anymore and I want to focus on this. And I think that what we also do sometimes, and Sha and I included, we tend to sometimes listen to the negative noise that goes on in our own heads and not from outside sources. I remember I went to CultureCon last year and I believe that it was, I want to say it was Regina Hall who said this, but we are the first voices that we hear in the morning. So if the first thing that you hear in the morning is you can't do this or you're going to fail or why are you applying to that job or you need to stay here because A, B and C. If you keep that negative talk up, you're going to believe that that voice is the only voice that you deserve to hear. Start talking to yourself nicer. Stop. Stop saying that you can't do it just because it hasn't been done. Mm -hmm. Just because a conference, a virtual conference by two Spelman alum, best friends, journalists, full-time freelancers, figuring it out has not been done before, that did not stop us from doing it. Just because something hasn't been done and it feels so far-fetched, that doesn't mean you, you can't do it. You be the first. And if you're afraid to do it alone, pull somebody in. I know that if I had this idea for BBW for BBWCon, I would have most definitely pulled Shia in because she's my team. She's my support system. Pull on your sisters. All 600 of you who are in the live comments, you now have a sisterhood that you probably didn't have before. And I think I saw in the comment section, someone said something about a group chat. Yes. I'm here for that. Like, please, please, please. It would be remiss of all of us to let this moment die here. Um, mm -hmm. I welcome you all with open arms to please stay connected with me. And I'm sure I can say the same for Shonda because y'all are really stuck with us now. Um, <laughs> like, I just, I can't even begin to wrap my head around what just, transpired today, honestly. Um, but I want to touch back on my don't let it die in a notebook comment and say to that as well, not every idea is going to work. We just mm -hmm. have to be honest with ourselves and the fact that like maybe for every 10 ideas you have, one or two will pop. But I'm yep. telling you, Whatever that one idea is, it's going to blow your mind because I have notebooks full of ideas, concepts, articles, events, like you name it, it is in this notebook. I wish I had it. I would literally show it to you right <laughs> now. But this is the one idea that became this whole grand affair. And I just yep. having, I just, in my spirit, it's just telling me to just keep stressing the fact that you have to just put yourself out there. You, like Shonda just said, like, stop, stop doubting yourself. Stop telling yourself no before someone else has the opportunity to tell you no. And then, and then even then you don't know that that person is going to say no. And yep. to be spiritual, but not to be spiritual, 
every opportunity isn't your mm -hmm. opportunity. There are some things that That's you're right. going to go out for, you're going to apply for, you're going to put yourself up on the table for, and you're going to get in there. And trust me, I'm speaking from experience. I've had jobs before where I was like, I was reading the job description and I was like, this is Shah Ravine needs <laughs> this job. Like your company is going to be better with me. I mean, of course you should all think that when you go into job interviews, but as I, when I took that position and I got in there, I was like, Oh no, honey. Um, <laughs> LOL, JK, this isn't for me. And that's okay because I think Denise Liv said this before, but she said it in relation to her body when she said, um, I have to realize that this is like a body of a growing woman, right? And sometimes when we have ideas about what we want our life to look like or what career we or career path we want to follow, that evolves with us. When I was younger, I wanted to be an English teacher. You did? Good Lord, no, I don't want to be an English teacher no more. <laughs> like, oh. I, did. Oh, I, I, was, I wanted to be an English teacher. I mean, I love kids. Don't get me wrong. But as I journeyed through, like, you know, literature and English and found my way to journalism, I was like, this is my concept of English this is my niche within this bigger umbrella. Like this is where my passion and my purpose lies. But I had to evolve into that. Now that's not to say that if I did go to school for education and became a teacher that I still wouldn't have found my way to journalism. But it's to say that sometimes your first idea or from sometimes your first ideology of what, what you want your life to look like isn't gonna be where you land. And that's okay. Yeah. You have to give your space, yourself space to grow, to learn. Like you don't even know who you are going to be five years from now. We all love to to create five year plans, but and it's great to have an idea, you know. Like it's great to be like, you know, in five years from now, I want to own this company. I want to be president of X Y Z. I want to start this business. But you have you have to have to have to give yourself room to grow. You have to give your ideas room to breathe. There is no need to just like rush and throw something together because everyone around you is throwing stuff together. And um, I think also, especially during this time, it's really important to touch on social media and the way that we compare ourselves to our friends, to influencers that we follow, to big brands. Um, there's such a, a stigma of having to be perfect all the time. We're human. Sorry. We all the cars today, huh? <laughs> um, but we are human. Um, not everyone looks like the filtered version that you see on Instagram. And you don't have to, you don't, oh, I just want to stress this, especially during this time, you do not have to perform every single day. It is okay to have an off day. It is okay to do nothing. That is fine. Yep. Let your mind breathe. Let your body breathe. Just because XYZ influencer you're following on the gram is always, you know, posted up in his or her Fashion Nova outfit or okay. posting, reposting like vacation pictures doesn't mean that you have to feel like an anxiety that you're not doing enough. Don't compare your journey to, to anyone else's like run your own race. I definitely agree with that. I feel like as, as two people who work in social media and communications heavy, we can't stress the importance enough. And I believe that I can speak for shy and myself when I say this, take a break it is okay to log off of social media. You, this is not your life. Your life does not live on this. Even if you do work in communications, even if you do work as a virtual telemarketer, even if you are an executive assistant who's always on call, you don't always have to be logged. In. You gotta log out sometimes. Disconnect. Believe me when I say anybody who needs to reach you can reach you if they really need to. If it's not dire, it's totally fine. I have gotten into the habit of deleting my Gmail off of my phone in high times of stress because I know that as somebody who writes a lot, I get a lot of interview inquiries. I get a lot of things from my bosses and editors, but at times I have to be honest and say, I can't handle all of this right now. 
I have too much going on and I, I just need to just unplug. So whether that's putting your phone on airplane mode, whether that's putting your stuff on do not disturb, I like to sleep with my phone outside of my room, not just because of radiation purposes and, and whatnot, but because if I am away from my phone, if my phone's in the living room and I'm sleeping in my room, I'm not thinking about who's texting or calling me. I'm not thinking about what emails I have to answer in the morning while I'm trying to sleep at night. And then another thing with social media is I personally like to do a social media cleanse at least twice a month. And for me, that means discarding of everything that does not serve me. And that can mean unfollowing any gossip pages. For me, I can't deal with celebrity gossip. I have so much going on in my own life. I don't care about what Kim Kardashian and the rest of them are doing. I just, I'm just so far removed from any of that. Friends or former friends that I don't really keep in touch with, or they're not like spiritually aligned with what I'm trying to do, or just don't set a good example for me. Because as women evolve, like Shaw said, we're still learning. And it's kind of like a monkey see, monkey do type of thing where it's like, if we see that something is working for somebody, inherently we're gonna believe that it, it might work for us. So if I see that somebody is posting a bathroom picture with a duck face and they're getting mad followers, inherently if I keep seeing it, I'm gonna think, okay, maybe I should try it too. But I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna put myself in a position to be impressed or, enhanced by anything that does not serve me. It's okay to unfollow people that are trash talking. It's okay to unfollow people that you don't have a healthy relationship with. It's okay, not even it's okay. Unfollow your ex if you know that that's not the best situation for you to be in. Unfollow that friend that you have a toxic relationship with. And it's, it's nothing bad, just you have to move forward. And on the other topic of evolution, I feel like we as women don't talk so much as well about the personal relationships that go into growth, especially as entrepreneurs and especially as as freelancers, and especially as creatives, especially as business owners. Not everybody, and this this really, really sucks to say, and it's going to hit somebody in the fields, and I know it will. Not everybody is going to believe in your dream. And that is okay. Not everybody is going to be on board with everything that you do. Not everybody is going to want you to quit your job so that you can pursue your passion. Not everybody is going to want you to break up with that partner that you're with just because you guys look cute together and they shower you with gifts. Not everybody is going to want you to steer away from that friendship just because you guys have been friends for 10, 15 years. Not everybody is going to support you. And as somebody who used to give so many dams about what people said, I'm talking to you from experience. It's okay for people not to support you. Look at Jesus. I'm serious. Look at Jesus. Y'all trying to calm down the comment section. <laughs> I believe that Ooh. me not having as many supporters as I would have dreamed of led me to where I am today. There were times where there were only five people in my circle who supported everything I had to do. And two of those people were my parents. The other three were my cousin, my sister, and my best friend. That's it. And that's all I needed. Sometimes there were people that didn't believe in me at all. And it was just me. And I had to be that positive voice in the morning to tell myself, you know what, Shonda, nobody believes in me. And that's cool because I believe in me. I'm the nice voice. I'm the cheerleader. Not everybody is going to want to see you succeed. There's mad people gunning for each and every one of us in this chat to fail. Cat Williams said it best. If, you, if you're at 14 hate haters and you don't get to 16 by the summer, then you're doing something wrong. Period. <laughs> no, no one is somebody that everybody likes. I don't like everybody. Everybody does not like me and that's okay. I'm doing what's best for me. I'm in mental health because I want to be in mental health. I quit the jobs that I've quit because they didn't serve me. I'm not friends with these people that I used to be friends with because I grew up. Mm -hmm. The Shonda train was in the station for some time and then checked the schedule. I said to myself, self, myself said, hmm. I said, I got to peace out. And that's just me growing. 
life is like a train schedule. If you stay in one station for too long, you're going to hold up the rest of the passengers that are going to get on. Then you're fucking with revenue. Then you're fucking with your schedule. Move on to the next station. If you keep pulling out and jerking and keep pulling out and jerking, what you're going to do is fuck up the engine and the brakes and the wheels. And you don't want to do that to yourself. You don't want to deter yourself from the blessing that you have at the end of your destination. Keep it pushing and don't be afraid to evolve. Like it's it's scary and growing growing pains are ah oh, they hurt. Like even a few a few weeks ago, Shaw and I had this big argument for no reason. Literally no reason. <laughs> Am I lying? <laughs> we did. No and that's okay because we we were growing and we realized that our methods of communication were growing we realized that the way that we used to feel about something that somebody did has grown. We realized that we're okay with things that we weren't okay with before. And we're not okay with things that we used to be okay with before. And that's okay. Growing is going to hurt. I mean, look at Molly and Issa. Just saying. Growth sometimes just means breaking apart. When your hair grows, what do you have to do? You have to trim it sometimes or else you're gonna have split ends. When you when you physically grow, your pants are gonna start to like look look like high waters. And you don't want that. You don't you don't want split ends and high waters. <laughs> That's the last thing you want. I'm serious. You don't want split ends and high waters. You want jeans that fit you nice, that you feel confident in. You want your hair to be nice and healthy and wavy and ooh, ah, and yes, honey, yes. You want to feel like that, like that bad, like that badass that you are. And that all comes with growth and being comfortable with growth. So it's all about adaptation. I mean, y'all, can we just <laughs> like hand Shonda off right now? Because my goodness, I just who I think I need a minute after that. <laughs> Wow. Um, what I will say to one of the points that you made was that is that your vision isn't for everyone. Yep. It's not. It, it like and that is as simple as I can put it. For sure. Your vision is not for everyone. Just like whatever product you creating is not created to suit everyone. That's why there is a thing called a niche market. Who are you marketing it to? I mean, if you have a product that everyone can use, then then great, go for it. Right. But a, lot of time, a lot of the time, we excel when we find our audience, when we find our people, when we find our customers, whatever it is that your product is. You just have to understand that not everyone is going to see things the way you see them. Not everyone is going to interpret your brand or your message the way that you've put it out there. And that just goes for like relationships and friendships too. That's the cause of most arguments. Yep. You don't understand, like you're, especially like in text messages, I could, I could take time to be like, oh my God, whatever, whatever. And she'll be like, why is she yelling at me? Why? Right. Like, why are you hollering? Right. I'm like, I'm not even yelling. I'm just like really excited or maybe really passionate about something. Um, But that's just a really important part of putting yourself out there and in executing a vision. You have to just understand that there will be naysayers. There will be people who will try to contradict every message that you put out there, especially the people in your life who you've known for a long time. And they'll be like, who is this Shah Ravine girl here? Because when I knew you in middle school, when I knew yeah. you in high school, I don't know what this for Kate is. And it's like, nah. This is me. I grew. I came into myself. And now I'm sharing that self with the world. And the girl that you knew back then, she's still here. She is me. She's just older now. Mm -hmm. She has a clear vision in life. She's doing what she feels like she needs to do and executing the vision that she feels like she was put in this world to execute. Yeah. That doesn't mean that I'm going to shade you because... We are on two different play playing fields now. That just means that, like, I grew up. I I found new parts of myself that I'm not afraid to share with the world. Um, and 
for those people who still try to pull you back into your old you or who you used to be or how you used to talk or how you used to carry yourself, let them stay in their corner. You have so much bigger and better things to do with your time, energy, and effort than to keep trying to convince someone that you deserve their support. Mm -hmm. True, genuine support doesn't need convincing. It's something that people will just do. Like, I, I've i never seen half the people in this comment section. More than half. <laughs> More than half. Probably 90% of you guys. I've, I've never interacted with you a day in my life. But here you are, sticking it out with us. Here you are, going off in the comment section because you wanted to. Because you saw something that aligned with whatever vision or passion or or desire that you had in your own life. I didn't have to beg you to do that, you know? And I'm very much appreciative of it, but it's just to say that you, whoever is in your ear, being that nagging Nancy, literally, like, we, what, what did Martin do? Like, skirt! Like, we just uh <laughs> Stay over there because I don't have time for you. And, and it goes into the other saying of like, everybody can't go where you're going. Yep. You cannot take everybody with you. By trying to take everybody with you, you may really well be weighing yourself down. And now you're trying to figure out like, why am I not growing in the ways that I want to? Or why is my energy and effort not being, you know, not getting me to where I want to go? It's because... You're trying to bring everybody with you. And some of those people that you keep dragging along who probably don't even want to be there mm -hmm. are weighing you down. You just, you just have to really become centered with yourself and, and your desires and your passions. You really, I, I mean, I think people speak on finding yourself a lot and I personally can say that it, that has been a very important part of my journey. Um, finding out who Sha Ravine is, what is her desires, what is her passions, what does she think that she was put into this world to do, and finding the right people to help me during that journey. And sometimes people who help you aren't always going to help you in big grand ways. So help is help. Honestly, looks something as simple as saying, hey, friend, how are you? Like, no, how are you really doing? Because I feel like we often in our day to day answer that question, like, oh, I'm fine, you know, so we can just get on to the next thing. But you really do have to have people checking in on you and asking you how you really are doing and pushing the topic, because a lot of us just let a lot of things fester and we don't say anything to anyone. And we wonder why, like, we're struggling. It's because you have to you have to allow yourself and the people around you that you feel like are your tribe a certain level of transparency, a yeah. certain level of just being vulnerable. Like, and I know that that's very scary for a lot of people, but there is a whole new world when you allow yourself to be totally and truly you and you present that to to everyone because i i'm one of those people where i i can't i can't act like i cannot act like anybody but me i can't be here with you all and be here with Deshonda and be this person and and portray a Shah Ravine for BBW Con and then in this conference and go be with someone else and be a whole different person. It to me that's exhausting. And I know for a lot of us out there, especially those who are in corporate America, you are expected to always perform. Mm -hmm. Especially right now in the pandemic, you're you're just expected to keep moving along with life like it's normal. And it's not. Um, especially as black women in corporate America, when we're at tables and in rooms where a lot of the people don't look like us and we have to figure out how to navigate both of those places. How do we show up as 
per se corporate shy. And then I go on my friends and family and I'm just like, I'm shy. But I feel like there comes a time where you just have to decide for yourself to stop, to stop tiptoeing in these two different places to start showing up and presenting yourself as your real authentic self and, and start living in your truth and, and not expecting everyone to always understand what your truth is. Your truth is for you and whoever aligns with it and whoever, you know, learns from it. But it's something that is deeply, is deeply personal. Um, it's something that you really have to do the work to find out. Um, and it's it's work that honestly is ongoing. It, it it never stops. You're always growing. You're always evolving, and you're always you know learning new parts of yourself. And and those new those new parts of yourself open you up to a host of different opportunities. I definitely believe that uh, one thing that you said for sure like stuck with me about living your truth. I feel like there is a sense of fearlessness and power that overcomes you once you start living for you. For anybody who is a mother, for anybody who is a wife, for anyone who's a girlfriend, who everyone, for anyone who's an employee, for anyone who is a daughter, you're more than just that. Before any of those labels, you are you. You are Shannon, you are Keisha, you are Simone, you are Shaw, you are Shonda, you are Natasha, you are Daphne, you are you before you are anybody else's version of you. So you need to take care of yourself. There is something that's just so, it, it's just so like, I can't even describe the feeling when you start being you fully and unapologetically, whatever that may mean. If that means cutting off your hair, if that means quitting your job, if that means trying something new, if that means starting a conference, living your truth fully, it, it, just, it just changes your life. I know that for me, when I was raped in college, I didn't, I didn't say anything. I did not say a thing. But when I decided to leave Besides, when I decided to leave that fear behind and live my full truth as a survivor and tell my story to other people, that's when my purpose and my passion started to come in. And I then realized this is what I'm meant to do. I'm meant to share stories. I'm meant to create communities. I'm meant to be that trusted adult, that trusted friend, that trusted sister, that trusted aunt, that trusted the daughter or whatever the hell may have you, that a lot of people feel like they don't have. When I started sharing my story about my suicide attempt, it was, it was rough. It was really rough because talking about mental health in black communities is such a taboo. No one wants to talk about depression, anxiety, childhood trauma. I mean, we talk about it, but we skate around it. We don't, we don't really get into the rink. We don't. So when you tell your truth, whether you're a breast cancer survivor, whether you're a suicide attempt survivor, whether you're someone who suffers from bullying or low self-esteem or you're in a violent relationship, when you start to tell your story, you really start to build that genuine tribe. And in that moment, you will then realize who is there for you. Because let me tell you something, I have lost so many friends along the way, and I can speak for Shah as well. We have lost so many friends along the way as we're coming into ourselves because some people may not want the evolved version of Shaw and Shonda. Some people might just want that middle school version, version that was, that was fun and that was lighthearted and just went to class and went home. But truth is life, life got real. It shit got real and shit got hard. So I grew and I had to grow with the times and I'm still growing. But in those times of adversity and in those times of hardship, and in those times of not knowing who you are and you don't know where to lean and you don't know where to go, that's when you find out who's there for you truly. That's when you find out who's going to come to you and say, hey, I don't, I don't know if you know where you're going, but I can help you figure it out. Or I know that you know where you want to go. Let me help you get there. Just as simple as saying, 
oh, I know this opportunity or as simple as showing up to this conference or as simple as saying, I don't know if this is something you're interested in, but here you go. Or you were on my mind. I do this thing where if someone's on my mind, even if it's somebody that I haven't talked to in months, I'll call them up and I'll be like, yo, you, you just came across my spirit real quick. I just want to make sure if you're all right. It's in those times of, of hardships and, and of scariness where you really realize who your tribe is. There are people that I don't talk to often, but we still have an incredible bond. I remember my, my friend gave me a present a few years ago that said, good friends are like stars. You don't see them every day, but you know that they're there. I don't talk to all my friends every day. I would love to, but reality is I can't. But I know that I had that foundation of friends like my cousin and my best friend and my mom and my dad and my brother and my sister where that that's all I need. And I know that God puts people in my life that just emotionally and spiritually know when I'm not okay. And I'll just get a phone call from somebody that I haven't talked to in months, maybe years, and they'll just be like, oh, you, you came across my mind. I just wanted to know if everything's good. That's God sent. When you're growing and you feel like the world around you is caving in and boxing you in and your people are forcing all these things on you, that's when you realize who's really there for you. And I'm grateful for people like Shaw who are not only equally yoked with what we want to do and our, our purposes and whatnot, but just being able to be true friends. And I can't express that to any of you enough. In the live comments, somebody probably found their new best friend. <laughs> somebody probably found their new business partner. Somebody probably just found their new accountability partner. Those are important. You never know who's who God is going to put in your life to help you grow because some people will just stand by the sidelines, but there are other people that will actually hold you by the foot and lift you up. If anyone has any questions for me or Shonda or any questions about anything that has transpired today, please um, type them in the comment section. We would love to answer them. Um, I had a point that I was going to make and then I lost it <laughs> and then I got it back and then I lost it. <laughs> like a win. Um, I'm, really, I'm trying to think. I really want to say something. Oh, um, about, about friendships. I, I through and through am a girl's girl. Like I am a friend's friend. I will go to the ends of the earth for my friends, um, especially to make sure that they're okay. Um, and to uplift them and support them and all that they're doing. And I think that it's also important to admit, to mention in saying that, because I feel like a lot of a lot of us place expectations on friendships and those expectations are never discussed. It's kind of just something that's assumed. They're like, well, I'm starting a business. So my friends are going to support me, period. But it's like, no, no, you would hope that your friends would support you, but they just might not. And you have to set boundaries. And I don't, I don't want to say set expectations, but you have to discuss how your friendship should operate in a way that works for all that is involved. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely have to set boundaries in your friendships that keeps it growing, keeps it flowing, but also make sure makes sure that everyone who is involved is comfortable in the the current state of the friendship and in the future of the friendship because as we both just stated today, we're all growing individually and mm -hmm. friendships can either grow with you or can crash and burn. And that's just honestly speaking. Um, but you have to allow for those tough conversations um, with your friends, with your business partners, with your accountability partner, with, yeah. with your um, significant others, whomever it is in your life that is, Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> I started reading the comments. Um, but whoever that is in your life that you hold close to you, you just have to understand that although we would love the best from everyone, sometimes 
people don't just have it to give. Um, and mm-hmm. you have to pour into them sometimes um, and hope and be open to receiving the love back. Um, again, if there is any questions, comments, concerns that anybody wants to share with us, we'll be happy to take those. Um, if not, I will say from the bottom of my leopard cheetah print heart today, <laughs> I am so, so honored that everyone decided to join us today. I can't thank you enough for seeing me, literally, um, and for just believing in this vision and for showing up and showing out and staying with us for over four hours now. Um, over four hours. Uh, this has been an incredible experience from start to finish. I want you all to take care of yourselves, uh, love on yourselves, check in with yourselves, check in with others, but please do keep the conversation going. I would hate for this fellowship, for this love fest to end in this comment section. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shonda and I's Instagram handles are on the screen. Please do hit us up. Um, keep in touch with us. We would love to keep in touch with you. I am just honored that you all just came here to uh, see what we had in store for you, to see what we created. Um, I couldn't think of like spending this birthday in quarantine any other way. Um, and to our amazing, amazing, amazing panelists and moderators, I am forever indebted to you all for lending your expertise to this conference and for giving us your time, energy, and effort. I, you guys are stuck with me. Um, <laughs> I'm not letting up. So when the next thing comes around, whatever that thing is, we will, we're, I'm gonna call on y'all again. If you're watching, you know that you are in my Rolodex now and you are in my circle and you are in my network. Rolodex. Um, I'm just like, I'm moved. My heart is full. It is bursting at the seams. And I just, I love you all. Um, I hope that you felt our love to you throughout this day. And I can surely see your love for us in the comment section. And um, Thank you a million times. And on that note, Shaw pretty much said it all, but we said it in the initial email, but brunch, I want to, for anybody who has water or wine, I got some rosé because who we this planning process was who child, but I want to raise a glass. Anybody who has a glass or an imaginary glass or whatever. Raise my water bottle, you guys. You can raise your water bottle. I want to propose a toast to all of you for showing up and showing out and being involved for helping us drive forward the conversation for making, sorry, like for making BBWCon more than just an idea, but for making it a movement. Like you all have no idea how much you made Shaw and I's wildest dream come true. It started off as it started off as two girls who were graduating college and had no idea what they were doing, walked across the stage and had no clue. We just knew that one day we were gonna be big and we knew that one day we would take each other to the top. So this this glass isn't for me or Shaw. This glass is honestly for y'all. Thank you so much for everything that you all have done to support us from launch to finish, for spreading the word, for putting it in your stories, for telling a friend to tell a friend, for staying from 12 to four, for staying for five minutes if that's all you could give, for not coming but telling somebody else to come for offering up your businesses for offering up your words of affirmation everything that you've done we see all of you every single one of you and like Shaw said you're you're stuck with us from now on like we're not just the founders of BBWCon 
we want you all to call on us as sisters as friends as accountability partners if there's any ever if there's any ever ideas or any ways to uplift any platforms that any of you all are doing our handles are here for a reason we're not just doing it for decoration we want y'all to keep in touch with us and it's not to increase following and it's not to increase engagement because Shaw and i couldn't care less about any of that we want all of you to feel this sisterhood that we definitely see growing in this live comment section. Like it's crazy how so many of y'all have connected within the past four hours. And I would think that you guys have all known each other for as long as Shaw and I have. And truth is a lot of y'all don't know each other from Adam. So thank you so much everybody for tuning in to BBWCon, the first of many, the first of Shaw and Shaw Productions the first of conferences, the first of podcasts, the first of tours, the first of everything that Shaw and I will have together from so on and so forth. This will be in physical location soon. We're not just gonna keep this as a digital conference. We're going to take it to Atlanta. We're gonna take it to Cali. We're gonna take it to Europe. And I am affirming this as we speak that Shaw and I will not just stop here at the 700 of you that came to our first event that just started off as an event in Shaw's Notebook. This is going to be worldwide. And we thank every single one of you for starting this movement with us. It's so much bigger than us. And you guys affirmed every everything that we've ever wanted. So thank you so much. I saw someone in the comment section that literally just gave me the greatest idea and hmm. said to start a private Facebook group for being yeah. on and we can absolutely 100 percent do that um because like we said before this will not i'm not even gonna say it isn't or it shouldn't it will not end here today um i literally cannot wait until we are all able to get back outside as normal because if this was the wildest dream i don't think anyone here is ready for what life will look like once we get back to normal. Um, because back to the whole fool once Ms. Rona leaves. Because um, I would not want nothing more than to see you guys, well, you ladies, well, everyone, because I don't know who's here. Um, <laughs> I would love nothing more to see everyone in real life so that we can, you know, connect physically and face to face and and we can share hugs and, and share physical love um but we will definitely keep the online community going because we just have to continue to support each other and before i even start crying i need to get <laughs> off of here um but please stay tuned to shonda and i's Instagram pages for all the information about the Facebook page that will um, be our community to keep the conversation going, to support each other, to love on each other. I just, this has been the most incredible day in a while. Um, this has to be, if not the number one, then a top five birthday experience Woo! for me. Um, I am just, I'm at a loss for words and I am choking back tears. So I am going to stop talking. Um, but from the depths of my heart, I love each and every one of you who have stayed with us today. And I cannot wait to continue to get to know you further. And please do keep Shonda and I and all of our moderators and panelists uplifted and support everyone who has something going on, even if it's just saying, I see you, sis. I hear you, sis. Um, I love you, sis. And I support you. I just, I can't. Like, my heart is beating so fast. <laughs> I cannot believe that, that you know, we did it. Um, and it's coming to a close. And my mother says happy birthday, Sean. Thanks, mommy. Yay. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> We're all one big family here, as you can see. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I love you guys for watching, um, and, and staying here and, and just fellowshipping with us. I couldn't have imagined this going any other way. Thank you all for 
the happy birthdays in the comment section. I see them. Thank you for the love in the comment section. Um, you don't even know the battery that you put in Shonda and I's back today to- Oh yeah, we're never playing small ever again. Like it, y'all honestly created monsters. <laughs> My mom even just said y'all created monsters. monsters. <laughs> it's, it's a right from here. Oh. I, I love you all for watching. I know I said it a thousand times, but I truly, truly do mean it. Um, and that's that's all that I have. Please do enjoy the rest of your Sundays and your uh, Memorial Day weekend. And we will certainly stay in contact with you all. Please do connect with us on social media so that you can stay updated. Yes. And have a blessed and prosperous day and keep, you, keep in contact with all of us like we we love each and every one of you more than words can express. So thank you so much. And now I'm going to go turn up for my birthday. As you should. As you should. I love you all. Bye. Bye. This is so nice. Huh?